we energized for the second day of the annual forum. And I have to, I do have to apologize for Dana because she's late today. Um, but of course the show goes on always, uh, but she will come hopefully in a moment. Um, first we have look back to, to yesterday. And I think we all have our, I think our memories and highlights of, uh, yesterday but one thing for me and of course we will make a report of the whole annual form with the statements with the sheets so that we have a good basis for future work of the alliance but one thing uh, and i think it was martin uh, who said it yesterday also to me is that it was refreshing yesterday we had last week, we had the, the Council of FEO. And of course, there we had hundreds of statements of uh, governments. But it's refreshing to see when we're sitting around in a multi stakeholder setting that much more is happening than we think. To listen to the different constituencies, what's happening on the ground, what's working what's perhaps could be done better but it's also became very clear that only we can closer to where we have to be if we work together on the ground in the countries with all stakeholders therefore it was very good to listen to farmers listen to science people from the universities listen to the private sector, listening to NGOs, of course, also governments, because they're part of it. But I think that was not only the added value of yesterday, but also the added value, I think, of the alliance. And it also became clear when we look back to yesterday, and there are some flashes which we bring to you now, but of course, you will see everything in the report, is that in the key opening, the scene was set by several, a clear message from Agnes Kalabati, a, I would say a powerhouse and a real leader, world leader. But the great thing of her is that she's and working at the global level as a special envoy for food system summits, for the food system summit and the follow-up, but she's also working on the ground with organiz organizations leading Agra, to see how they can improve agriculture, sustainable agriculture production, climate smart agriculture, and much more, I would say in the region who needs the most. We had a clear statement by the World Bank. But for me, it's also clear, it was a great statement, but they are sitting on money, on funds, which should be spent much more on the ground. Because you can always find conditions why you should delay any funding. But we have to call them also to action. And they have more money to spend than they can spend. And the former boss, they have now a new president, he will advocate again because he said, the only thing we need to do now is to work with the farmers and the private sector in the countries. We have huge funds available. Make sure that we transform the setting at the country level where we find pathways with round tables with it from the start, not at the end, from the start with the farmers and the private sector and other stakeholders to develop business cases. Would it be on food losses? Would it be on cold storage? Would it be on better seeds? That's what we need. And I spoke with Martin, and again, he promised me this, but if we have our 10th anniversary, certainly the World Bank will be there. We have to call them to their responsibility and accountability. Did they do it? And not in a negative way, in a positive way. 
it was great to see that Marco Keller on behalf of the International Agri Food Network was clear in his message. The private sector stands ready to work with all of us. And that's a strong message because we need each other networks. It's not only about the private sector because we need academia and we need the NGOs. But the message was clear and that's important to know. And last but not least, divine. He's in him, climate smart agriculture is embedded. He is, and that was unfortunate that we have problems uh, nowadays with visa, especially from African countries to come to Europe. It's unbelievable how Europe is becoming a fortress. But it's great how, is, how active he is, not only for the youth, but creating an e-learning academy, making sure that more people are engaged in trying to get climate smart agriculture done on the ground. When we look to innovation, and I think many, one, one or two, I would say, clear message came through. First, sitting here is excellent, it's marvelous. But we have to do more, and we can do more, because everybody's speaking about knowledge sharing, experience sharing, pilot sharing. And we have amazing capacity nowadays with the internet. And later on today, we see how we can do more with it so that we not only once in a year or twice in a year per year are sharing, but that we, we can continue a continued exercise by sharing our experiences about capacity building, about pilots on the ground, but also about the needs, etc. Because then we can come closer to each other and then we can find partners. And of course, when it's, we speak about innovation and technology, it's everything, many said it, about ac accessibility, about bring it to scale and about affordability. But even if we can manage that, we just cannot send or bring te technology to a farmer or a country because you have to do more when it comes to capacity building, to training, but also listening to the farmers, to the markets, to the needs, and then see what, how we can transform and pinpoint our capacity building. And of course, everything has to be done at the national level. At the global level, we can create an environment to, for support, but we have to focus now on the national level. And we have an excellent instrument now with the World Food System Summit's pathways, which are being developed. But you all have to make sure that the pathways are not something of governments or not something of NGOs only or civil society. It has to be pathways of and for all of us, making sure that the right people are sitting around the table. And doesn't mean all stakeholders, because then even the plenary hall at the third floor would be not big enough, but make sure that you have those on the table who can transform. But again, also there, it was, the statement was clear. We need financing funds, and we need to share via the dig, digital arena we have. The youth is the future, future was the third. And it's always, yeah, and have, of course, I'm quite biased when it comes to the youth, not because I'm young anymore, but I can always, I will always be inspired by the youth. And you saw it, what they are doing with the World Food Forum. And we have Jessica here uh, with us, uh, and she's now so active the last three years in what, we, we, what the youth is doing. But also they make clear it's about not giving just the floor to make some statements, but get them actually involved in the decision making, and especially at the country and local level. Make sure that they're part of the organizing of the activities. They clearly made a statement about a paradigm shift. Make it lucrative for the youth to be part. No. Make sure that we are listening to them. Make sure that we have an enabling environment so that they will participate. 
And it's not only about becoming a farmer. There are so many jobs needed in the whole value chain. And that's where it can be very lucrative for the youth to be. To yeah, be to be and it means also, and there was a clear element, to get them in, we need to see how we can support startup programs. And later on, we'll have a presentation this morning about an initiative which we hope we can launch about a startup program for, for the youth. We went into the action groups in the afternoon. And it was exciting to see what came on the table. Some of the same elements, um, but clearly, the action groups prove themselves again. And they be, should be the center point of our work the next, cop, next couple of years. It's not about only awareness raising of the farmers. It's everything about inclusiveness with all. A clearinghouse mechanism was tabled again, knowledge sharing. but also the multi-stakeholder approach came clear. And of course, Ernie and Alison and Rosa will work on the report of that session because there are so many messages which is difficult to, to contain. Today, that was yesterday. It was a witch day. We kept it a lot. But it gives also a clear task to do more and to make sure that what we discussed, what we think about, how we bring it to the next stage of implementation. <clears throat> Today we go into what can be done in the near future. And we brought speakers together around three themes. Capacity building was men mentioned many times yesterday but how to make it practical. What can we do as an alliance? How can we support what can be done? And there are already good initiatives underground. We hear from the World Farmers Organization, from we hear from Bayer. We have a presentation about a program on compass funding. Not that we have, uh, would like to have it, but we don't have it. Millions of funds. But we hear a presentation about, there's more out there than we think, but how to, access it, how to grab it. And it's not only about international financial institutions. There's much more out there. But we have to know it, and we can make full use of, again, the digital network which we have. Last not but not least, it's about the youth and perhaps starting on a small scale, but increasing something about, we call it a shark tank approach, but we have to, of course, reformulate it because otherwise we get problems with uh, some of the team, it's in copyrights, et cetera. But how to support the youth with, um, with the idea of startups. And we hear some, a great presentation and some practical already ongoing work of John Cordero, who is now working to make sure that that's going to happen. And then we have to watch our time. We go to the regional alliances because one thing is clear, as I said before, the global level is there to support. And I said, we have made our commitments, our heads of states. We have developed with Agenda 2030, a clear program of work. We have identified also last year in the World Food System Summits, clear actions to be taken but they have to be translated to the regional and the national level. And their regions become in, need to come in strongly. Why? Because every region has its differences, whether it would be in Europe, whether it would be in Africa, Asia, Latin America. And we have to think about what the regions, what can the regions do together to make sure that their needs their ideas are listened to and implemented. I think that's why 
and Fred Yoda will guide us through the regional alliances. That's why the regional alliance is becoming so important for the work of the Global Alliance. I stop here. In the afternoon, we in the afternoon we have to do also the nitty-gritty work around governance, etc., and to look forward how we can uh, further improve our governance base. But I do hope that we, based on what we have done uh, yesterday, have again a very exciting day. Be very interactive because it becomes now concrete with clear ideas about three programs which we would like to implement, but we can only implement it with you to further develop it and make it concrete, but with you, and then see where we are. That I, good morning. I give you the floor to open uh, to uh, go to the capacity building, the first item. Okay. And I'll I'll give a bit of a reflection from yesterday. So good morning, everyone. And I hope you had a great night in Rome last night. Yeah, so sorry for being late. Um, I think uh, with our colleague from Nepal, we had, or India, we had such a great night walking along the roads of um, Rome yesterday. So um, a bit of a reflection before I hand over to our first session. Um, yesterday, I think we, GAXA, managed to really respond to the overarching message that there's a need for efficient, or what I would call bang for your buck engagement. And yesterday, I think there was a lot of guiding principles that gave us from the opening speeches, from the keynote, and from the action group reflections on really how to have bang for your buck engagement. Uh, what I also noted is really the call for coherence is getting more and more emphasized. Coherence, what do I mean by call for coherence? There's amidst all sorts of approaches, there's agroecology, there's the whole food system approach, right? And we are sitting here to look at how, what is the role of CSA and I, I believe that CSA has such a great role within all these approaches that we know we needed to be involved with and to be engaged with. And let's remember that CSA has a central role amidst all of these approaches now, given that the climate crisis has never been more emphasized. And especially since countries has made pledges for higher ambitions to reach targets that contribute to so many pledges like the Paris Agreement and the SDG targets, even though we all know that we are running late in meeting the SDG targets. So yesterday, it was great to know suggestions that we are actually aware of, but we know we need to intensify and made more efficient of the role that GAXA can offer in order to build more meaningful um, engagements. We know that we need to elevate farmers and magnify their actions and investments play a crucial role in this. As a new co-chair with Hans, I have really been dreaming of securing funds that will allow GAXA to do this and your feedback from yesterday provided a great mandate for Gaza to proceed. Um, the examples of best cases that Hans has summarized has really shown that Gaza has a role to play in exchanging information around. And so today we are all ears on these three proposed projects that will highlight this bang for your buck engagement. And we wanted to really proceed with that. And so I have the honor of opening this session five, the capacity building um, proposal for the GAXA e-learning and the GAXA app, right? Yes. And so I call on Mr. Frank Vandermeer online, yeah. who will give us a presentation of the proposal. She <laughs> well, okay, we have a lot of gender neutral pronouns now. So <laughs> I call on Ms. Hi, Frank. I'm sorry for mutilating your pronoun. Uh, I think it's a global problem these times. Um, we, we're really all ears and we're very excited to hear the proposals. I give the floor to you. And before you. we go to Fabke, just one word. 
Pompka developed this program when she was working as an intern for the GAXA team, mm -hmm. Citation Unit. And the problem is with good people, they're always bought by uh, others. Yeah. So now the European Commission took her away from us, uh, but she has done great work on what she's now going to present. And it's a firm basis for further work. Pamka, the floor is yours, but I had to say this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Chairs, for the introduction and the floor. Um, in addition, I would like to thank all GAXA members for their in-person and online presence here today, as I think this is truly of invaluable importance to ensure that we can achieve these new aspirations for GAXA as outlined in the 2023 action plan. Um, I will quickly introduce myself. I was already mentioned by, um, by Hans and Nada. My name is Famke. I joined GAXA in November, 2022. And during my time as part of the facilitation unit, I predominantly worked on the zero draft for the GAXA capacity building proposals. And therefore, it's an honor to be back here today in my capacity as former intern to present this project to you. This proposal was the result of the findings from the GAXA survey, which was conducted by Cornell University in 2019-2020. When asked about which initiatives were needed to overcome knowledge barriers regarding CSA implementation, the most frequent answers included the need for more capacity building projects and farmer-to-farmer -farmer information networks. Based on these results, the following two proposals under the GAXA capacity building heading were developed, and I think the discussions yesterday very much showed how necessary these projects actually are. Um, the first proposal is the Climate Smart Agriculture e-learning course, which aims at training young farmers, students interested in CSA, policymakers and investors on CSA approaches, to address the capacity development needs identified by GAXA members and to create the future leaders with a solid background in CSA. The course will be divided into specific modules addressing CSA topics from an interdisciplinary perspective. As you can see in the, in the next slide on the table, uh, in, in addition, every student will uh, receive, besides the normal modules, a personalized modules focusing on CSA case studies. Participants can, show, can choose upon their registration their own specialization in the form of a specific global region and or agricultural sector. Subsequently, this third module will provide them with three successful CSA case studies and one failed CSA case study according to their chosen preference. The aim is to include in every module a set of online pre-recorded lectures, GAXA case studies, and a final examination. Additionally, the GAXA Facilitation Unit would like to complement these online trainings with lectures from guest speakers from our GAXA member base and beyond to introduce this intergenerational exchange between young students and practitioners within the same classroom. Upon successful completion of the course, participants will receive a GAXA certificate. This was a quick overview of the GAXA e-learning course. Uh, the second proposal under the same capacity building heading is the GAXA app for farmers. So on the next slide, you see that this project came forth out of the need for more farmer-to-farmer -farmer information networks, as identified in the GAXA survey. Since it's despite this urgent necessity to implement CSA approaches on a global level, adoption of such practices has been slow. One of the major barriers has proven to be the exclusion of farmers' local knowledge in the implementation of these innovations. And therefore, to tackle this problem, the facilitation unit would like to propose the development of the GAXA app for farmers, which will be an application for your mobile phones. The, if we could have the next slide, please. The app will function as a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing. Can we show the next slide, please? Yeah. The technician could show the next slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so here's the GAXA app for farmers. The app will function as a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing, capacity building, and networking platform, all in three. It will be divided in two sections, namely we will have the discussion portal and the knowledge portal. Farmers will be presented with tailored content in both sections based on the information acquired upon their registration, including their preferred agricultural sector and region. 
So when opening the discussion portal, which you can see here on the slides, the user will be presented with group chats from their chosen region and sector. In these chats, farmers will be able to connect and interact with each other, as well as with local agricultural researchers, policymakers, and investors to facilitate this co-learning. The knowledge portal will focus on addressing the specific capacity development needs of farmers. The content in this section will be tailored in a similar way as the discussion portal and will include CSA case studies, relevant regional data and capacity building trainings. So this was a quick overview of the entire capacity building proposal. I would like to thank all of you once again for taking the time to listen and provide feedback on these proposals. And to conclude, I would like to emphasize that both projects are still very much in a zero draft stage and therefore open to all your input and proposed changes. Moreover, I would like to encourage any members interested in developing either the CSA learning course or the GAXA app to reach out to the facilitation unit, as only with your help and expertise as GAXA members, these projects can move forward and make a difference. Thank you. Back to you, Chairs. Thank you very much, Pabke, and thank you for your hard work. And we do hope that we can buy you back. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, we first have the presenters before we have a discussion so that we have a clear picture of everything what's there around capacity building. So it's my pleasure now to give the floor to Stefano, Stefano Maras. He's the Director of Global Partnership Universe of Bayer. And Bayer has already a long time experience in trying to get farmers together advance climate smart agriculture so with pleasure i give the floor to stefano thank you thank you very much thank you hans thank you dada and thanks to everybody for inviting buyer to contribute to this discussion i would like to yeah perfect uh actually so i sent this presentation i made some changes this morning before as i was listening to hans and dada but this will work fine so um i think i only have five minutes right so to go very quickly um can you can you please go to the next slide okay so great um Bayer has um several commitments by 2030 to support the 2030 uh, development agenda and one of these is to reduce by 30 percent the field ghgs footprint uh, of the most emitting crop systems by 2030, including rice, uh, corn, soybeans, etc. Then we also want to become climate ne neutral by 2030 by reducing our own emissions in our operations by 42% uh, and then offsetting the remaining emissions. And finally, we work with uh, upstream and downstream um, suppliers and, uh, and customers to reduce their impact by at least 12.3%. And all these targets have been approved by the science-based target initiative led by CDP, UNGC, uh, WRI, and WWF. Um, next slide, please. So our uh, livers that um, uh, Bayer has in its portfolio, but also in the pipeline, because there are many things that are not still in the hands of farmers, but that in the next few years will uh, be there. Uh, well, we have uh, extensive agronomic expertise on multiple crops, uh, including cereals, rice, maize, soybeans, which are the main ones, and uh, also fruits and vegetables, cocoa, potatoes, etc. Then we have, uh, as, as a science-based company, we have an R&D expertise in breeding and biotech for the development of crops that can withstand drought, floods, floods require less water and less fertilizer. Then expertise in digital tools for precision fertilizer application, inoculants for biological nitrogen fixation and crop protection solutions, including biologicals. I want to stress this, allowing no-till farming. And finally, we have um, expertise built in the last four years on building and implementing accredited carbon credit projects. Next slide, please. 
I, I will go very quickly on this. These are just a few of the partnerships that we are part of uh, that relate to climate change. So there is Aim for Climate, EU Carbon Plus Farming Coalition, LEAF Coalition, which is focused on forest finance. Next slide, please. Uh, Living Soils of the Americas and Scale Direct. There are more uh, on the ground uh, uh, projects that we have. Again, just a couple of them, but we have many more and I will be happy to share more uh, offline with, with whoever wants. And of course, with GAXA, the GAXA team. Uh, next slide. And our contribution to GAXA capacity building projects could be the following, but would not be necessarily limited to these. So we have a lasting relations with 45 million smallholder farmers worldwide, 30 million in Asia, 13 million in Africa, 2 million in Latin America. Then we can provide case studies of successful CSA practices for the module three of the online course. I highlight here successful, but of course, uh, there are also some uh, issues we have we are in the process of learning of piloting projects so we also have not just successful cases but also lesson learned from let's call them failures or uh, issues that we uh, as a company uh, are facing and to overcome which we definitely need partners and finally expertise in designing and implementing courses with universities to train agronomy students to train farmers because one thing that i as I went through the uh, proposal, which I find very, very well thought and very well designed, there is one um, apparently small, but I think very important and crucial um, point that I think uh, should be addressed, which is um, online uh, training is, it can be great with university students, um, based on our experience is less, um uh, doable when it comes to smallholders so what we do we have an experience already with uh several um universities i think about 40 universities across uh asia and uh, especially in india but not only uh where we train uh students agronomy students but also medicine students uh, on a safe use uh, of uh crop protection products and then they go onto the fields and uh, train in person uh, the farmers. So that's that's one thing I would like to discuss also with the GAXA team in charge of the capacity building project. Uh, we also, just to conclude, have uh, a wide, a huge network of partners um, from all sectors, not just the private sector, but also governments, NGOs, uh, academia, and uh, um the the three universities that are involved right now in this project we are collaborating with them on uh projects already so we uh we know each other and we know many of the people also who are in in the room so thank you very much i think i uh said it all uh for now i uh, happy to to join the conversation and and answer to any of your questions Thank you very much, Hans and Dada. Thank you so much, Stefano. Nice to see you here. Um, I think you, I hope you stay on because I have even, I have questions regarding our partnership in Asia as well, where we are trying to really answer the question, what's the benefit of carbon farming for uh, small scale farmers? And I know that there are some good case studies from the Bayer experience. So, um, without further ado, we would really, as yesterday, we were really emphasizing that farmers have the centrality in our discussion. And we are um, joined by Maria Gulia de Castro, who's the Advocacy Policy and Partnership um, Officer from the World Farmers Organization, who's going to give us their own. Um... Hi. I thought that's a different one um, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cher, and thank you for having us here and bringing the farmers' um, perspective. Uh, so first, I would like to congratulate GAXA on these uh, new initiatives. We are always um, thrilled to support any initiative that put farmers uh, at the center 
um, especially young farmers. It's really an important pillar for the work of, of WFO. Um, as we really believe that uh, young farmers are really agents of change, so we really need to uh, invest in their empowerment. Uh, so I'd like to um, highlight a few points, uh, provide some inputs uh, on the learning curves specifically, based on our uh, experience with capacity building. So our, just to briefly present our main uh, capacity building program, which is the gymnasium, uh, we implement it in close partnership with Bayer and starting from this year also with the support of Andreas Hermes Academy. Uh, so just to briefly explain to you what it is, uh, basically we gather a group of around 20 young farmers from all across the world among our members. Uh, we gather them, for example, in this third edition online. Uh, so they meet online um, for four modules. They meet with international experts on agriculture related topics, including climate change and climate smart agriculture, for example. Then they also have the opportunity to uh, participate actively and advocate in international processes and conferences on agriculture related topics. And um, they also have the opportunity to be trained by a coaching team, as we believe that this is also part of enhancing their capacities. Uh, so starting from this, um, our inputs, uh, suggestions for the e-learning course would be uh, the following. Uh, so first, uh, we notice that the um, target, let's say the targets of the e-learning course are, uh, seems to be uh, quite broad, which is good on one side because uh, we reach, we want to reach as many people as possible. Um, but we also think that we uh, should take into account the uh, specificities of each uh, stakeholder sectors. Um, because uh, all the stakeholders have different needs and, and different and comes from different realities across the food systems. Um, so we would suggest perhaps to um, concentrate more in having con content majors or focuses uh, based on the profiles of the ones who access the course. Uh, because, for example, a concern of a young farmer uh, on climate smart agriculture may not necessarily be the same of a policymaker and vice versa. Uh, second, we would like to suggest that also uh, the goals and evaluation mechanisms are tailored based on the profiles of those who access the course so that everyone can maximize its participation. Um, and third, uh, we want to really stress the importance of the active participation of the young farmers. No, so um, not to see them just as trainees or beneficiaries of this kind of initiatives, but really engage them in the content building as well. So really modeling the course. Um, with regards to the barriers uh, in the, for the implementation of this course, uh, we would like to uh, highlight um, the importance of considering the financial um, and infrastructural challenges that the young farmers may face. Uh, so we also uh, see them in implementing our gymnasium, uh, for example. Uh, so the operational structure of the initiative should uh, be inclusive both in its financial aspect and in its interface. Um, and for this, uh, we would highlight the importance of uh, engaging also farmers organizations on the ground. So they could play uh, an important role, um, both as facilitators in building strategies and also operating as liaisons to reach out to as many young farmers as possible. Um, so yes, just to highlight the need to like take care and pay attention to the potential barriers for the young farmers, such as the infrastructures and the costs, um, to guarantee the operational participation of the young farmers in both designing and implementing uh, the initiative so that we ensure inclusiveness, and also to encourage to benefit even more uh, from the knowledge and networks of the farmers' organizations at both uh, local and global level. Uh, so I think this is it. Thank you very much. And we look forward to the further developments and con contributes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to be in a class with a gymnasium. And it was really amazing. Uh, and I would invite everybody, if you have the possibility, to go to such a class. Because what you see is enthusiastic young farmers from all over the world. And it's not only about what they learn during that course, but they start a new network. And that network is then spreading from in their countries, in their regions. And that's the great thing of working with the World Farmers Organization, working with Bayard. It's not only those who get the training itself, 
but how it spreads, I would say, among their networks. Where Great. Is the physical, where's the physical gymnasium? So this year they will meet at COP28. So they will gather there for their final module and also participate in the COP session. We'll make sure that you will get the information uh, about the next session of the gymnasium. It's a pleasure, of course, because we cannot do without the youth in such a session. We are already speaking about it. To give the floor to Domenico Vito. He is the Global Smart Agriculture Youth Network Country Coordinator for Italy. Uh, he's very active. He was also very active in preparing this uh, session of the annual forum. Mm -hmm. Domenico, it's a pleasure to give you the floor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, the invitation and congratulations for uh, this amazing uh, venue and this amazing possibility to talk about uh, agriculture, youth and engagement. I really congratulate with all the team of GAXA and uh, uh, to the chairs and ambassador also for supporting us and our network on, uh, on our work. And also I concur on the words on uh, uh, our ED divine that uh, has been inspirator for several activities that we are doing. So I'm Domenico Vito. I'm uh, the coordinator of the Global Climate Smart Agricultural Youth Network for Italy, and also uh, coordinate like CEO of the uh, Climate Social Forum, that is a platform uh, we could call a virtual agora that we let available uh, for uh, the world network. You have seen yesterday from uh, my colleague uh, Divine uh, a glance on the activity that we are doing with the platform, like the e-learning. Uh, virtual academy to spread properly and uh, connect the different uh, center of health excellencies and the interns that are now are active for uh, in learn about climate smart agriculture. I will contribute to this session on capacity building, especially giving uh, an input uh, on a survey that we did properly to build uh, like e-learning platform in order to assess and to tailor for the young farmer uh, the best solution in terms of uh, e-learning activity. So, okay if, okay, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, yes, this brief about myself. I, uh, I come in from my IT background, so I very feel this problem of engaging also with the learning platform. So uh, you can, if you can go to the next slide, I will present the uh, survey. Yeah, the survey was coming from a big project that uh, we call AgroSmart that uh, is connecting uh, data and uh, also uh, knowledge sharing together properly to let available for farmers. Uh, this platform is completed with uh, also, uh, uh, for example, GIS tools and so on that we are developing uh, and uh, we are proposing also for eventually next session of GAXA. And so you can go in the, into the next slide, please. So this is the survey that was talking that we launch and uh, we collect uh, at first in the, in the first gland the preliminary phase 100 um, uh, responses from uh, uh, 38 different countries. Uh, next slide, please. So the survey was uh, divided in section in order to assess different areas. The idea was to tailor and to like uh, uh, shape the, in the best way, also considering each aspect of the problem. So crop game farming, information and connection, how, to, how is the access to the market and so on. Please, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, I will, in the, in the meanwhile, I will explain a little bit. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, in the, briefly, I, I will just explain the section. The first section is about uh, understanding how the, the farmer are cropping actually, and how is managed the crop. Uh, the second part is about how they access to information and connectivity. And how and the third part is about the marketplace and how they sell the product. And the idea was to tailor these uh, um, these information properly to understand which were the main needs of the farmers. So this is like the distribution in which all the the responses has been spread all over the the world. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, again, next slide, please. So. I will show here some of the results, of course, of the survey uh, to let available also for the uh, e-learning platform. Uh, this is like uh, the uh, distribution of the target. So how much were like organic farmer, how much were traditional farmer and so on. And we saw that it was a quite div diverse 
type of farmer that we address uh, in, in, in order to say the situation uh, about the uh, like uh, the assessment of the uh, climate smart uh, agriculture is uh, still ongoing we have to like transmit this kind of concept also to the uh, ones that are practicing agriculture actually next slide please so we have tried to assess also if the responder were really small farmers uh actually most of them were like uh, um uh, with a, a yard that was uh, less than one hectare in order like uh, in in, in um, line with this result uh, we assess that actually we were facing properly with small farm and for us was a really important point because we want to assess properly with young uh, small farmers next slide please so we try also to understand which type of crops uh, are uh, used for the uh, young farmer and small farmers uh, in order to understand which type of information we need to share. As I say, the survey was uh, to like uh, have a sort of photography of the situation in which we want to uh, like spread our knowledge and so on. Next slide, please. We try also to understand the seasonality in production I show this uh, result just to say which kind of aspect we try to reach and to ask to the farmers. Next slide, please. And also the cropping complexity. So how far they are doing, for example, the intercropping, how far they are doing uh, uh, like uh, sustainable practices and so on, uh, in order to uh, like see if uh, uh, when we were talking about climate smart, they could follow us and they could uh, like uh, uh, apply really in, in their quotidianity all the concepts that we want to uh, transmit them. Next slide, please. Also, we assess the women involvement. We saw that uh, women involvement is uh, is very crucial, but also uh, what we assess is that uh, women are very involved in mostly in the into the collection phase. And uh, one thing that we observe that is important to foster the role of women also in leadership in agriculture. Next slide, please. Um, we assess also the, the type of technology that uh, and the technology in agriculture for most of them technology was the use of pesticide of mechanization so we asked them what you, what is technology for you and which type of technology you are using and uh, we saw that uh, for them the use of pesticide and mechanization are the most uh, like considered technology in uh, applied in agriculture next slide please uh, at least now uh, i'm going to finish uh, was uh, this part was really important because uh, uh, we also asked the asset to information when we want to spread through a learning platform and so on we also need to assess which type of media that they are using and which type of device the final result and i will resume this in the next slide is that they are mostly using a, a smartphone most of them now they have access to internet but they the, the preferred device we can say is the smartphone rather than the laptop that have a less percentage of uh, of spreading and uh, and and sharing so next slide please okay if we can go to the uh, conclusion okay let's go to, uh, next slide please i will conclude Next slide, last one. Okay, I will uh, resume for the sake of time the main uh, result. So uh, what we take from this survey? Uh, this survey was important for us, as I said, to assess. Uh, we want to deal with the, the farmers, but knowing them, not just like putting a technology without uh, like make that make it appropriate. So the goal was to make an appropriate use of technology. And we assess that the role of women is important, need to be fostered, especially in leadership. And also that in general, small farmers have a community as knowledge share use of information. So they, uh, they are very community based. So um, their way on using information is to collect, for, for example, one of them is collecting, but then they are sharing the information and they are using this information to have a collective benefit. And this for us was an important information. Uh, moreover, uh, they are quite aware of the phenomena of climate change. Uh, so uh, when we talk, we were talking about climate change to them, they were aware, but for them, uh, the climate smart practices are most, were mostly agriculture, agri agroforestry, sorry, and organic farming. Uh, so not all, we can say, we can say not all the techniques that are uh, in the, into, the, into the set of the climate smart agriculture techniques are available. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Domenico, for your presentation. And again, it's, of course, it will be shared with all of you. Now, as the last two speakers together in this session about capacity building the program under development are Alexander Scheinborn and Julius Divier. And if you bring a farmer and a digital student together, you can do miracles. And both of them are very much involved and have an interest in using technology and solving real world problems. And also using the digital possibilities to share it with many. So it's with pleasure as an example of work and practice to give the floor to Alexander and Julius. You have the floor. Alex, we can't hear you, I think. Alexander, you, I think you are mu muted. We cannot hear you, Alexander. Can you hear me or is it just Alex? Julius, I can hear you, but I cannot hear Alexander. <laughs> okay, no worries, I can kick it off and Alexander can maybe uh, pick out the technical um, issues uh, happening in, on his end. So many thanks uh, for having us, really appreciate it and um, for inviting us. Um, as you said, I'm gonna introduce myself real quick. Maybe Alex has rejoined in the meantime. My name is Julius. I grew up on a farm in East Germany and probably as everyone working or growing up on a farm, growing up, my biggest ambition in life was becoming a farmer and also a good farmer. And that's why I spent a lot of time uh, driving tractors and doing these kind of things and really enjoyed to this date. Um, after my A-levels, for example, I went to Canada to experience their kind of farming. And at some point I thought, okay, maybe I need to get a different perspective as well. And so I went on to study economics and computer science um, later on, and now I work for Google Cloud, and that's where I met Alex. Alex, are you with us? Or yes, can you hear me now? Uh, perfect. Yeah, we hear you. Brilliant. Okay. Well, this turns slightly on my on the head what I was going to say, but I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a computer scientist. I currently work for Google as a consultant cloud engineer uh, as well. And as a quick caveat, we're both employed by Google, uh, but we're taking we're talking to you today. Um, kind of in our own doing with our own opinions. And this is work that we carry out in our, in our own time. So it does not reflect the opinions of Google. Um, I'll be starting a PhD at the University of Cambridge in September on the topic of AI, particularly AI's applications for tackling environmental risk and improving agricultural processes. And back at university, when I first encountered AI, I became intensely fascinated about its potential use in agriculture. And I, I found a very attractive property of solutions that mitigate environmental risks through AI optimization is improved resource usage, um, promoting sustainability and business viability in parallel. And we've seen this in, in other industries like logistics or, or manufacturing. Um, to date, implementing sustainable farming practices and farmers expected yields and potential profits are inversely related. So pressure to make farming sustainable has to come from external forces such as governments who impose regulations or consumers who are willing to pay a premium for sustainably products, sustainably produced products. Um, we believe that farmers can use AI powered tools to address their own problems and as a byproduct, make their businesses more sustainable. Farmers can and maybe are already intrinsically motivated to run their businesses in sustainable ways. They just need the, the tools to do so. Uh, and the example I, I like to give, uh, and it's an example that Julius first introduced to me, which is using fertilizers in agriculture comes down to a compromise between short-term yields to kind of feed a growing population and, and maximize year, yearly profit, um, but also long-term yields to keep the soil healthy and to keep the farm going for generations to come. Um, and, and a potential use of AI would be to help farmers optimize their total win by using fertilizers, which is both environmentally and financially costly, only when needed. This is just an example. So um, when I met Julius, with his understanding of technology and farming background, we were able to further reason about the potential uses of data and AI. And he opened my eyes to the importance of agricultural processes for which I was previously unaware. 
So with that, I'll let you just talk about the long road towards digitization. Thanks, Alex. So to kick it off, I think I don't have to mention how important um, the work is that every one of you is doing, because I think agriculture is really basically the foundation our civilization is built on. And um, farming in a sustainable way is going to be much more important than right now in 10 years, probably. So I really appreciate the hard work everyone is doing. And that's also what Alex and I, um, what keeps motivating us doing this in our spare time. I think um, in the future, or actually already today, there's three trends that are going to kind of drive this kind of innovation. First of all, it's IoT. And I think Hans alluded to it earlier. Um, we need to be scalable and also affordable. And IoT devices, basically small computer chips that we can install in the field, are becoming much more affordable than now than it has been a couple of years ago. And the second pillar um, our projects are built on is global connectivity. And through satellite internet, basically, we are on the cusp of reaching global connectivity all around the world. And I think this, is going, this gap is going to close down in the next years um, quite drastically. And last but not least, um, what Alex expertise and also a bit of my expertise is generative AI and LLMs and everything that is happening in this field. Everyone probably read the news in the last weeks and months. It doesn't pass a week where there's not a um, new breakthrough in the artificial intelligence space. And the two project, projects Alex and I are working on right now built on top of these three pillars. And if we go to the first um, project on the next slide, please, we see um, our first um, project we're working on. And this started actually on my home farm because we have one of these irrigation systems on the left-hand side, you see an illustration of it. And we were wondering how can we optimize the way we irrigate at a very, very cheap price point because there's solutions out there that are kind of expensive to control an irrigation system. And we found a way to develop a prototype that we can retrofit on this irrigation system, which is basically gathering data. And on the right hand side, you see our web application that we are building that basically allows us to control this irrigation system. After some discussions and after some time thinking hard and deeply about this, we noticed much more is possible. Because once we have an IoT device on these irrigation systems, we can do site-specific farming. We can take pictures of the plants and we can run, for example, classification algorithms to define or to see that some plants need more nutrition, they are sick or something is happening. And this kind of decision support um, approach um, brought us to a second project, which we want to present here on the next slide, which we called Acri LLM. LLM, for those of you who are not familiar with it, stands for a large language model. And it's basically what is allowing us these big breakthroughs in AI. And what we propose here with this project is um, a large language model, which leverage, leverages the site-specific information we have from the first project and uses it on a fine-tuned large language model to basically give advice to every farmer. And these large language models, it's, it's like just to get, get it clear, it, it's not like another chatbot. It's really tremendous how much information and how precise this information um, can be brought to the farmer. And we can bring it actually at a super low price point to all over the world. These are the two projects um, we wanted to talk with you about. Um, Alex, do you have any um, other comments? Yes, um, I was just gonna say that these two projects are, I think kind of present an interesting paradigm uh, to consider where they're not independent from one another. They can actually be mutually beneficial. Um, having farm management platforms that ingest farm data, uh, and, and in our case, we're looking at irrigation data, but it could be a whole host of, of different data. In addition to a large language model, which is a new method for interfacing with existing world knowledge, we have this very, very powerful systems that can be likened to high level decision support systems, which is getting into the realm of, of a personalized automated agronomist. Um, and if we could just go to the last slide for our kind of call to action. Please don't hesitate to, to approach us or email us. These are our emails. Uh, we would love to hear from people that are generating agricultural data. And we are particularly interested to talk to fertilizer companies and explore possible collaborations on, on that sense as well, because uh, a very good use case of this would be fertilizer recommendation. Um, we didn't have time to give a live demo or a more concrete view of what we're working on, but if you do want to see that, we're also happy to schedule another chat to, to talk about that. And I want to finish kind of rather rhetorically, and I state the questions that have been mildly obsessing me over the last couple of years, and I invite you to consider them as well. Um, firstly, 
what is the potential of putting computers in fields to improve agricultural process efficiency? How can this impact um, sustainable farming practices? And also, and this has to do with the kind of knowledge sharing part of, of the session, how could this democratize access to high quality farm specific agronomist style information? Um, is it scalable and hence is automated agronomy consulting within our reach? So with that, I will hand it back to the chairs. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much, Alexander and Julius for your presentation and your work. I've already seen a part of the demo uh, in, in, I would say in progress. I will make sure that we share with you on the website of GAXA when it's finished this demo so that you can go to it. And of course, what you've seen this morning, it's a program of GAXA under development. Uh, under development when it comes to capacity building via e-learning, an app, and perhaps more. And of course, we have selected the speakers because they are hopefully partners in the further development of this program. We have open briefly for some comments or reactions before we go to the next program uh, in development of GAXA, because you see, we are trying to enter the new phase from awareness raising, uh, building on the concept now to action on the ground. And to, with, as I said to all of you, we have to do it with you, with your comments. And of course, we'll put this also on our website so that we can collect comments in the further phase for further developing and financing this program. I open the floor for anybody who want to briefly reflect on this. Marcel. Thank you, Chair. And thanks for all the good presentations. Uh, what really stood out for me, it's, it's coming back a number of times, are basically two things. What works best is peer-to-peer. -peer, and what really connects uh, is uh, mobile phones and internet. And these two things are really, uh, if you want low profile, easy, uh, low cost to, to do. And they can have, of course, a, a tremendous range and a tremendous impact. So peer to peer and using apps, mobile phones is really something that stood out in a number of presentations. And I wanted to note that. Thank you. And thank you for your positive uh, feedback. And indeed, peer to peer, I and mean, later on, we speak about regional alliances and going to the national level. I think that combination could be very fruitful, but of course, we need your support also to further develop it. Yeah, thank you. I, I also would like to, uh, to say thank you to, for the excellent presentation that we have uh, had. I just have a couple of, of comments. I can see that there are different initiatives that are showing uh, the capacity building of the CSA. Uh, some of them are really spread in different in different countries. So is there an initiative that can join efforts just to have some courses in different languages because peer-to-peer -peer internet needs language basis just to reach a farmers? This is one of my questions. And the other question is how, what about the value chain? What about the supply chain? What about the CSA with regard to the whole food system and not only be focused on what is going on at farm level? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see. Yeah, I see several hands. Uh, I will take three more, uh, and then four more, and then uh, we conclude this item and we continue this discussion. Um, and Rosa, it's in, indeed. I think it's important. Of course, we are looking to the language issue, uh, and as of now, we have certainly also the regional alliances. We have now French English translation. And uh, of course, it has to be in multiple languages. Also, when you are going to work with, for example, an app, you have to see, and that perhaps is easier nowadays than uh, when you do it, uh, I would say, in person. But we have to work on that. And also, of course, it's not only about the whole idea of GAXA is climate smart agriculture from the farmer to the consumer. So we have to look to the aspects of the market, the value chain as well. And I give lady here the floor. 
Thank you very much. A very quick comment. Thank you for the very interesting uh, session on capacity building, as I am also a climate change uh, negotiator uh, on the agenda item of capacity building within the UNFCCC process. I found it uh, very interesting. And um, I would like to suggest uh, uh, GAXA to join the uh, PCCB network within the UNFCCC process, which is the Paris Committee on Capacity Building uh, Network. Yeah. Um, which already uh, has more than 300 uh, members, uh, and uh, I think it would be um, very beneficial, uh, mutual beneficial for GAFTA and the uh, PCCB uh, to be more connected. Thank you very much. We'll certainly take up that offer. Thank you so much. I saw, and then your neighbor first, ladies first. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So we just heard a lot of interesting uh, application uh, applications, uh, but but still um, the mode of implementation it will be very crucial on this. How GAPSA plans to to really capture all these interesting uh, e-learning and applications, and I think one of the suggestions that. Uh, a while ago before me uh, would be one mode of uh, implementation that GAXA should have some rooms for participation or engagement in international fora so that uh, what we have we could uh, you know we could uh, publicize and uh, maybe if it needs endorsement or mainstreaming so uh, let's I hope GAXA's participation in international policy dialogues will be very crucial as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I go now to your neighbor. Yes, Aganga John from Uganda, a smallholder farmer. Uh, uh, just a quick comment. One, I have been raising this in a national and international meeting. Uh, when we talk about cap capacity building, in most cases, we must target people at a, at a higher level, a higher level institution of learning, who have passed through higher level institution of learning. But again, as we are considering as a GASCA, we should also start thinking about those to build the capacity of the, 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 the farmers, especially those, the, the, the small farmers, because they are the, the, the majority. Then another thing is the e-learning. The e yeah, with the most mostly, I'm, I'm I'm representing farmers. That's one, but also I'm representing people from developing countries. Uh, with the e-learning, it is so good and very essential, and we have noticed noticed that e-learning has been so essential when we got uh, COVID nineteen. It took it, it 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 gave us a very good lesson, and uh, in the developing countries. E we need also to build the capacity for for e for e-learning. Therefore, when we are targeting uh, to to build, I mean, to build the, the capacity in farming itself, all the science and the practice and so forth. But again, also we should also know that e-learning in developing countries is still a problem. It is still lacking. That's why you see many meetings. Uh, on online, but people are not attending it. And then uh, I would also let me stop by uh, thanking FAO, because FAO now has, I have been reading, I read the day and night, but FAO has a lot of information. And uh, sometimes might, someone might raise something and think it is new, but when FAO has uh, gone through a long ago, but people don't know. And you could say, what is there, what's wrong? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We certainly uh, listen carefully and we take note and come back to you. I give now the floor to Divine because he just started an e-learning academy. Divine, you are online, so your floor is yours. Yes, can you hear me? Loud and clearly. Good, perfect. Thank you very much. Greetings from Cameroon. Uh, I'm happy to get all the comments from the presenters. I will answer this in three different points. The first is about the I want everyone to understand that CSY and be able to translate the SDGs into local languages, official 60 official local languages. We initiated the process in 2015. That's number one. 
This is to say that our e-learning platform is going to be translated into local languages as well. Seriously, we are bent to do this. Already, we are working with uh, our team in Kenya to translate the DAXA documents into Swahili. This is our commitment between now and the end of the year, 2023. Number three, I heard comments about um, how do we, how is it that the, the internet penetration is low? Why people not attend meetings? I just want to say one thing. First of all, there's, a, there's an aspect of passion, and we have been able to we have been able to demonstrate that young people have the passion. There's an aspect of commitment. We've been able to demonstrate that young people have the commitment. We've been able to equally demonstrate that young people are resilient in anything they are doing. But they need what we call policy framework established for young people, with young people and women. Number two, the last point I want to raise here, of course, being one of the strategic members of GAPSA, we are very, very keen. We are very, very keen. And really strongly, I mean it, that we are there to change the paradigm, to ensure that the global alliances, the regional alliances, fully integrate the e-learning framework that we have established. So this is our commitment to GAPSA. So GAPSA, we are giving you the e-learning platform to come in. We are giving, we are giving the e-learning platform to, to, to patron it. And that's why Ambassador Hans, from inception back in 2013, he's been beyond us, ATO as a whole, I want to say thank you very much to all the UN sister agencies over there and colleagues. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Divine, <clears throat> also for your hard work. And I saw last raise hand here. Thank you. Um, I think I think a lot of discussion here is about dealing with the enormity of the task in terms of providing credible important information to, I think we're sort of at about close to 600 million uh, smallholder farmers around the world. That is an enormous challenge given the scale, uh, the resources they have, et cetera. And so we're looking at, I think, some really great solutions related to peer-to-peer, -to -peer, digital tools, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> the only caution I would have is that when it comes to giving advice to farmers, that we have to be very careful that what we're giving them is good advice. And also, uh, uh, there are errors that can be made. So when an agronomist, a trained agronomist, goes out and provides advice to a farmer, that agronomist has a body of scientific information that he's dealing with, but he also has insurance. If he makes a mistake and the farmer loses money, um, uh, he's, he's insured against that liability. And, and, and so I think we have to be careful that in any of these tools that we provide, we're ensuring that there are, you know, caveats in terms of the advice and that there's credibility and, uh, and that there's some consideration of the potential liabilities as well. Thank you very much. And thank you for your caution. Because I've seen also at a certain moment an app working in practice where it was used by farmers. They could make a picture of their a disease in their crop, send it to uh, a university, and then they would get advice. But two or three times, they got the wrong advice. There was no insurance, nothing. So at the end, who lost was the farmer. So that's why if you build these kinds of programs, you have to make sure that you do it right. And that's why I thank you so much for the caution. And Certainly also, we cannot overeat. It has to be a step-by-step -step approach. Last one, Alison, and then we go to the COMPASS funding. Oh, thank you so much, Hans. Thank you for the great presentations. Um, I just wanted to offer that um, Cornell University has developed uh, a Climate Smart Agriculture online course in the past and offered it for farmers. And we've talked in the past with Rosa about developing something in English and Spanish together. Um, we really would like to be part of this to um, offer, as Clyde just said, the research expertise that, that's needed. And Cornell is now part of a new NSF, National Science Foundation, AI Institute grant that just was announced yesterday with Colorado State University uh, Minnesota and Purdue. Purdue has extensive expertise in doing 
courses and online courses um, for agronomy. And so we were already planning to develop a climate smart agriculture course through that project. So it seems like a natural fit if we can partner with GAXA. Thank you very much, Alison. Certainly we come to you for the next phase of the development of this program. We now go to the next program, work in progress. And that's the Compass funding platform. I've been working for many years already in the international field, especially in the field of sustainable agriculture, natural resources, etc. And I know that there's so much funding out there. And you hear stories, fake news, etc. And every time I went to the internet, and I'm uh, do internet for dummies, but I could never find the real information I needed. Would I be a farmer? Would I be somebody working in the value chain? Would I be working for the government? To have a quick access, what's out there? Because we, we know we have, to, we spoke about the World Bank, we have EFAT, we have the Green Climate Fund, by the way, it costs almost two years and 500,000 before you, anyhow, you get a program uh, to the boards. Yeah. So the question is whether or not it's efficient, but I think that's the information we need. So we thought about it. We sat together with some uh, involved partners and we thought about using again, the digital platform to get more information out there for those who need. So I now give the floor to Valentina Vitale for the presentation, work in progress. And then I go to Oshani Pereira, Valentina. Thank you, Chair, for the introduction and for giving me the floor. Honorable Co-Chair, distinguished GAXA members and colleagues, of course, from the facilitation unit. Good morning, you all. It is a great honor to me for me to introduce you the Compass Funding Platform, which was led by a colleague who could not present today the proposal, so she kindly asked me to step in. So this proposal um, is also a result of a long research done in the last couple of months, and we found out that despite an urgent necessity to implement the CSA approaches on a global level, the adoption of such practices have been very slow. One of the main reasons is due to a lack of access to potential investors and financing opportunities. So the Compass Funding Platform indeed would like to create an impact in increasing investment opportunities for farmers concerning CSA practices. Next slide, please. The main objectives are linking, linking farmers to investors through the development of an online platform so that farmers can propose their business ideas. Helping farmers by guiding them through specific tools guidance, such as writing skills, how to design a project, and how to attract and contact potential investors. Last but not least, creating networking events to attract funds and new investors for CSA-related activities. Now, how is this platform working in specific? So both farmers organizations and farmers, as well as investors, have to create an account in order to have access to this platform. They have to disclose the category to which they identify and provide specific information related to their own organization. All the details provided during the registration to the platform are absolutely necessary to divide the applicants in different categories according to the different criteria, such as location, interest, products, and type of subscribers. Once the registration is completed, subscribers, subscribers have the possibility to browse that already existing proposal on the platform or simply create a new one. Next slide, please. In order to create a new one, an application form should be completed. The application form is different for farmers organizations and of course for the investors. At the same time, the great initiative of that platform is that it will work only also as a knowledge formation in which subscribers have the possibility and find online tools and guidelines on how to apply to funds and how to design financial proposals. All these materials and documents will be designed and proposed in collaboration with the action group and GAXA strategic committee members from the six constituencies. Of course, a financial task team will be set up for these activities, 
once we will start the development and the implementation of the proposal, of course. Now, in conclusion, if we want to have a full and successful function of this proposal, we all need to support and collaborate with all the GAXA members. To do so, we, all, we strongly suggest you to widespread this initiative in order to avoid the failure and the disuse of such platforms on the farmer side, which happened in the past. In addition, we would also like to propose a side event a gathering during the next annual forum, that will be a great idea, in which we will attract potential investors and increase funding from small scale farmers and farmers organizations on CSA. I thank you all for your invaluable feedback, potential feedback I will get and support as always for GAXA and I am, and of course, for attending this important meeting today. Thank you all and oh, the chair, um, over to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Valentina, and of course, this is the ideal picture at the end of hopefully all the program. The first part, of course, is which is under development is to develop and make available what's out there in funding. As I said, you have to start with where, what are the funders? And if you have sketched the funders, then you can start to zoom in. Uh, Etc. But of course, it's work under development, and it was done by Asha Cortelessa. She was again an intern working for the unit, but she was hired by the Global Environmental Fund. Mm -hmm. So start working as an uh, intern assures you for a good follow-up. <laughs> gives us problems, but nevertheless, I think the thinking about sketching what's out there funding possibilities of course we don't have the funds itself sketching the possibilities and also the criteria sketching on the side the criteria for each of the funders helps understand where we can get to and helps to perhaps go to what was presented by Valentini at the end but it's still work in progress long way to go and with that I give the floor to Oshana Oshani Pereira co-funder of the Shamba Center for Food and Climate. And she's working on a daily basis with investors, several investors. Would it be pensions? Would it be equity funders? Mm -hmm. She knows what's out there, but she knows also how difficult it is from both sides. Because if you have funders who want to fund, but don't have to, the capacity to develop programs, where do they get to? Because it's a complete world out there and we have 194 countries and probably 100 ideas, only all from governments. Then we have 100 ideas from farmers organizations, other organizations, and then the private sector as well. So how do we get the focus? Oshani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hans. Thank you. Uh, exactly on that point, uh, there is a huge mismatch between what SMEs and small farmers are looking for and what capital markets have to offer. And why? Could I have the next slide, please? And why? I'm going to give you just two reasons. Uh, and one is that approaches and designs and technologies that are climate smart are unfortunately still considered by funders and capital markets to be unproven and therefore risky. Uh, this is really a paradox uh, in, in, in reality today, that as much as we are exposed uh, to climate change, and as much as agriculture and food systems are suffering because of their exposure to climate change, those who are forerunners and doing climate smart practices and putting their money there are not rewarded by funders. It's really a paradox. And the second thing is what um, the Compass Initiative is putting its finger on, and that is ticket size that it costs too much for investors to go from small loan to small loan or from small equity size to small equity size. It just costs too much. So we are trying 
to find a solution at the Shump Center. And the next slide, please. And we're trying to find the solution because we've been speaking to a number of public investors, including IFAD, the GEF, the Green Climate Fund, the multilateral development banks. And what, what we are observing is even the credit lines offered by these institutions, they don't systematically require that climate smart performance is a mandatory prerequisite for preferential lending. And I will need to repeat that because here is where the market making may not be happening. That if public funders and public development banks are not making climate smart performance a prerequisite to level the playing field, then it's very difficult for non-concessional funding providers to step in. Next slide, please. So one solution, one solution to this issue might be aggregation. And aggregation is happening. You are already an excellent example of aggregation. So aggregation can happen through farmers, organizations, cooperatives, lead farmers, etc. Also across value chains, as you know, contract farming, preferential supplier, in contracts will help that. And that level of aggregation is important because it makes it easier to demonstrate aggregated numbers on financial performance. And let us not forget the non-financial performance, which is the unique selling opportunity of climate smart entrepreneurship. So we have today potential opportunities around ecosystem services in the form of biodiversity credits. We have carbon credits, we have soil health, we have water use. Let us not forget that in two years time, we're going to be in a global water crisis. We are all actually already there. But by the end of the decade, our demand for fresh water is going to exceed the supply. Water is the next goal. Next slide, please. And this level of aggregation, ladies and gentlemen, is very important because when you look at how capital markets work, they also work on aggregation. So at the level of the institutional investors, it's huge not not so small circle is where the money is but they need but it needs to filter down to small businesses and small business lenders and to filter down the larger you group together and the larger the ticket sizes can become the more possible it is to actually access funding this technique is called securitization i don't want to get too technical, but moving to the next slide, what we are doing and what we'll start doing in June is we want to explore the feasibility of an X of an SME. I call it SME, but it is also for small farmers, an SME and small farmer funding platform where we could provide the preliminary screening just to match. SMEs with financial intermediaries. We won't go far as funders because the ticket sizes are difficult to deal with. So if you work with financial intermediaries, what they do is they bring a lot of small farmers together into a pool, make that a product, and then be able to sell it on to other larger capital providers. And this will reduce transaction cost because the biggest cost for funding providers, be they public or private, concessional or commercial funders, is finding the right SMEs and putting them into pools that makes funding possible. 
And the last slide, please. Because the biggest question that makes me hesitate, and I had the opportunity to talk to Hans about this when we last met some weeks ago, is deal flow. Are we going to find within a reasonable amount of time enough small farmers and enough SMEs in the food system to make the platform viable? Because the reality is what Julius and Alex said earlier in their talk, there is an inverse relationship be between being climate smart and getting a hold of your costs and being financially attractive. Unfortunately, the moment we are being climate smart, our capital expenditure and our operating expenditure might be higher. This poses challenges for us to find financing. That is the reality of the market today. And it has to change. It will change. It is changing. And the final, final slide is that it would be such a delight and honor and opportunity and much more for us to sit with Gatsa and begin to unpack this and see how we can contribute and even join you in making Compress this platform, which will do both. Both what you just said before, but as, as well as understand the dynamics in capital markets, the dynamics in development finance, and actually try to put deals together. And aggregation is very important moving in that direction. And it's back over to you, Chairs. Fantastic to be here. Thank you very much, Oshani, for your really to the point and excellent presentation. And you can be assured that we are going to sit together in the next couple of months as Gak said, to work with you to see how we can bring it to an implementation what is so much needed. And you carefully drafted, I think, the, the challenges. Also, the, the caution. But I know for sure that we can make it happen. I now give the floor to Margaret Munema. I hope I pronounce your name well. <laughs> she is the CEO of Palm House Dairies and founder of the Twisty Palm House Foundation. Pleasure to give you the floor. I thank you and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I am a dairy farmer and a milk processor from Kenya. And I have been a dairy farmer for many years. So I'm joining you today on behalf of the Global Dairy Platform, representing the pathways to dairy net zero. I will be talking on farm level investment for climate smart agriculture in the dairy industry. Uh, the dairy sector plays a critical role in sustainable food systems and contributes directly and indirectly to all the sustainable to all the sustainable development goals, and especially in terms of ending hunger, eradicating poverty, women empowerment, better nutrition, and the list goes on and on. The dairy, the global dairy community is accelerating climate action and is helping reduce the sector's impact on the planet. In 2021, the dairy sector launched the Pathways to Dairy Net Zero initiative. Pathways to Dairy Net Zero initiative raises dairy's ambition to accelerate climate action by reducing its greenhouse gas emissions over the next 30 years, while at the same time enhancing the essential role that dairy systems play in nutrition and livelihoods. Now this project uh, includes FAO, IFAD, Green Climate Fund, the Global Methane Pledge, 
USID and SAI, among others. It is backed by 200 leading organizations representing over 40% of the global milk value chain. The initiative brings together dairy systems of every size and type and organizations throughout the dairy supply chain. Uh, so like I said, I am representing the global dairy platform and the work that we are doing in pathways to dairy net zero. And therefore I will be talking about a little bit about what uh, spam house dairies we are doing in Kenya. Uh, like I said earlier, I started as a dairy farmer. I started with a cow. And as you know, when you have one cow within no time, they become two, three, four, five. And eventually I had many cows and uh, I was selling a lot of milk to our dairy cooperative. Uh, but uh, when the opportunity came about, we decided to start a dairy processing company when the milk, when the milk industry in Kenya became liberalized. Prior to that, the milk industry in Kenya was a monopoly. And we have partnered now over more than 20 years with more than 500 small scale farmers. And when I mean, when I say small scale farmers, I mean, yes, small scale farmers. Farmers even who have one or two cows are our partners. And they, they sell to us the milk. We process this milk and sell it as yogurt and white milk and other products. On this journey with our farmers, we have focused on the resilience of our farmers and we want, we have always wanted them to have better lives and better livelihoods. So in addition to the obvious programs to address the productivity and quality of milk, we have also taken several measures to help the environmental profile. Now, majority of our farmers are women, actually 85% of these farmers are women and we, we encourage them to do mixed farming. So therefore they keep cows and they also grow crops. Uh, this way they are not putting uh, their eggs in one basket, so to speak. So they, 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 they have, uh, they, they, they plant vegetables, they, 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 they plant uh, 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 maize, uh, but uh, the dairy is however, very, very essential to them. Uh, dairy cow ownership has positive impact on a range of welfare indicators and that has been reported. Dairy farmers empowers women and boosts their social and economic capital. And as maybe many of you know, uh, but uh, uh, dairy uh, supports 1 billion people in the world. So a billion people rely on dairy for their livelihoods in the world. And that is really key. And because of this, uh, the day, as the dairy industry, we really want to succeed and in reducing greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, because we, we must continue to, 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 to give nutrition to the world and, and, and good income to, to the one billion uh, uh, people who rely on the dairy industry. So therefore this means action is needed in both developing and developed world and different actions are needed in both places uh, depending on the situation. But in my operation in Kenya and, and by the way close to 90% of the dairy industry in Kenya is through the small scale farmers. So in my operation, what are we doing? One of the things that we are doing to mitigate climate change is to plant trees. Uh, we all know that trees uh, help uh, prevent soil erosion. They improve rainfall patterns. And uh, we don't just plant trees, we plant fruit trees and therefore they provide better nutrition and income because some of these uh, fruit trees are uh, like avocados. So our farmers are able to sell the avocados even as they mitigate climate and they get more income. Uh, I like the presentation uh, by, by Oshani before me because funding is important. So how do we fund? Uh, we have 
we have we 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 have partnered with a Rotary uh, Club in Nairobi. I am actually a Rotarian, so my club has come in and tree planting in Kenya is big. Uh, uh, our government is encouraging us to try to plant trees, and therefore this is a national initiative. So our Rotary Club has come together with us, and we have put money together. And one of the banks, it's called INM Bank, has a foundation. The INM Bank Foundation also is funding tree planting in Kenya, and they have also uh, funded us to, to plant trees with our 500 small scale farmers. And this uh, has, has really helped. Uh, so we, we, we actually make sure that when we plant the trees, the trees grow, and we have competitions where where we award to the farmer who has who has actually grown the best trees, and this really motivates them. Uh, so that is one of the things that we do. The other thing that we do is uh, we help our farmers install small scale biodigesters because, like I said, our farmers are small scale. This we do by connecting them to microcredit institutions that can give them money, we vouch for them, uh, kind of like give collateral for them that uh, if they get the loan, they will pay because they're selling us milk. And, and, and therefore, uh, they, 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 they are able to get a, a, a green uh, energy. And for some of our farmers, this isn't really a switch to green energy. Many of these farmers did not have electricity in the first place, and they are moving to a climate smart solution right from the start. And, and that is really, really uh, good. So because of time, uh, uh, I think I will just highlight on those two, but uh, the other things we do like uh, soil testing to make sure that uh, our farmers know the state of their soil and therefore the, the advice uh, on how to make their soil better. This also we do with a partner who funds this program and therefore funding and partnering with people who can fund uh, 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 these is initiatives, especially for the small scale farmers, is very, very key. Uh, uh, now, going back uh, to, to Pathways to Dairy Net Zero, in December, the Green Climate Fund announced that it would support Pathways to, to Dairy Net Zero in four African countries, that is Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, and my own country, Kenya. So we need the resources to make these changes in a bigger way. Uh, and, and, and I suppose this is what is uh, campus funding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so really as a, as a woman entrepreneur in Africa, it is really excellent to see any initiative focused on farming. Farmers are the key to food security and without us, looking after our farmers, enabling our farmers, uh, there is really not much we are going, we are not going to be able to do much uh, in terms uh, of food security. Our farmers also are the most at risk in terms of climate change. They are the ones who are most at risk in terms of inefficient, inefficient systems that emit greenhouse gases. And uh, yet our farmers are, are, the, uh, are, are the best in mitigating uh, climate change. And therefore we must talk to our farmers, we must fund them and we must listen to them. Uh, and therefore it is important that we must make funders with the actions we need uh, to mitigate uh, climate, climate change. And, and, uh, and this especially must be available to, to food systems in developing countries. I suppose also in developed countries, but I think in developing countries, we need this funding more, uh, both at, a, at, at the level, at, at national levels, and also for small projects that more, more directly reach the farmers, like the the funding that we have gotten is farmhouse dairies with our with our partners. Uh, that is uh, very very uh, important, and and we look forward to seeing this build and grow. I was very happy yesterday to see uh, one of the speakers from World Bank uh, to see one of the speakers from IFAD, 
And we, we need this kind of organizations, this kind of people to come and hear us speak. We tell them our needs so that they can, they can help us. Uh, so I think I will stop there. Uh, just to say thank you very, very much for inviting me to this forum. I have learned a lot and, and I pray that uh, going forward, forward, we will see this continue to build and to grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. Great to have you here. It's also great to learn from your practical experience and so clearly stating what is feasible, but also what is needed from a farmer's and market perspective. We have set the scene now for, I would say, the project program on compass funding. And as I said before, Gax is going to work with Oshani Chamba Center to further develop this idea so that it become practical. And you will hear months back. But I give the floor for a couple of remarks, brief remarks before we go to the youth and the startups. Ernie. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Hans, and thanks for all of the presentations in this particular area. And as I listened to the, the multiple dimensions of it, I was really drawn to our last speaker who talked about the needs of the farmer. And when we identify, and, and I'm getting back to what is the core function of GAXA, when we are the forum that can surface and identify needs and advance opportunities, we are providing, I think, a very critical, valuable service, because back to where the action is most needed, it's on the ground. And as you've been um, commenting, Hans, we've got to go from global and discussions down to where the rubber hits the road. So in this area of finance funding, uh, what's going through my mind is what is the role of GAXA? Is our role to identify the need and advance potential models for others to carry out and implement that have particular expertise in this space? Or is it us taking on the role of actually providing the support service? And I think there's an important distinction there between identifying the need, advancing a recommended model, like what we're talking with the Compass concept, uh, and recognizing that we probably have partners in the world that have expertise in that space that we may not have. So I'm, I'm just reflecting as we go forward on what is our role, what do we do, and what do we hand off to others to do, and then be an advocacy voice to make sure they're doing it effectively. And whatever we decide to do, there will be limits of what GAX's capacity is in terms of expertise and resources to actually succeed with. And I think we just want to be selective and careful with what we agreed to do. So thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, I think it's a, a crucial question also looking to the future. And of course, you have seen it when we are, were presenting uh, the three projects or programs. Of course, it's not the idea that the Alliance will become an implementing agency. But at the same time, we can take initiatives which then are taken up in the framework of the alliance, like we are doing, for example, with Paya, the World Farmers Organization, like in this with the Shamba Center, who is willing to further develop, to help further develop it. So that we have a context, because for them it's important that they have a context in which they can work and find their partners. I think that's the balance we have to, to, to seek. I give the floor. Can to I speak? Hello? Yeah. Can I speak for? I'm Shailat from yes. India. Better go to Dada. Okay. Okay. Shalat? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think at this point is very well taken. But uh, let us understand three important things. First, knowledge, expertise, and technology is available. Second, what GAXA can do and need to do is identify the needs. Who needs what? And from these sources, where knowledge is available, expertise is available, or uh, uh, manpower is required, that is available, it, it can access. So 
suggestion is that in all these areas, we have capacity. If this GAKSA group has a capacity. There are people who are organization which can deliver results and which are willing to do it. They are voluntary organization. They are non-voluntary organization which are willing to help. For say example, capacity building. For example, technology transfer. And there are uh, organizations in countries and groups which need it. So if GAKSA develops a kind of a exchange bank, then we can deliver. Suppose somebody needs the climate smart agriculture training, we provided it to Ghana. And there is no need for physical training. It was done through uh, web and air like this. So the climate smart agriculture training to Ghana University agriculture scientists, we provided from India. Similarly, to the, all those who need climate smart agriculture training, we can, or for like us, there are many organizations who are can provide. Second is we can ava make available the publications which can be translated in local language and GAKSA can take initiative to identify these publications with each organization it's its own capacity building guidebook. So my suggestion is that in all this entire context of um, yesterday's discussion and today's discussion, let us develop an exchange bank and share with everyone and GAKSA becomes the, the moderator. Thank you for giving opportunity. Thank you very much, Dada. Okay. Well, this is very much uh, echoing that we're going to facilitate helping. Uh, some of the development here. But Valentina, thanks for the very nice presentation of Asha's work. What I wanted to maybe suggest is that um, ask Asha to work with the regional alliances in developing this, because for one, the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network, for example, would really love to help her further develop it or probably pilot it to scale. And at the same time, also a suggestion that not just incorporate traditional donors, but maybe, you know, your next door neighbor who's very rich would love to be there, personal philanthropers. Yeah. Okay. These are just concrete suggestions. Thank you, Donna. I go to Donald's. And, and then Mark. Yeah, yes. And then first that lady and then Del. Thank you very much. Is this... yeah. 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 For those of you who haven't met, I'm Donald Moore. I'm the executive director of the Global Dairy Platform, one of the organizations behind pathways to dairy net zero this is my first GAXA meeting I will be at the next one I'm just start by saying that I've been very impressed particularly I think linking some of the initiatives discussed here today yes. discussion of World Bank and EFAD etc I just want to make two points the first is that we have been running a series of pilots in parts of East Africa for some time now and We've been working with an organization called the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Emissions, and they have done research that demonstrates that about 40% of emissions can be reduced by implementing practice change. And one of the challenges that I see in the funding model is that most of the funders are interested in funding assets. They're not interested in funding process change. Yeah. And we've got to find a way where we lobby groups like the World Bank to point out to them that if we want to meet the 2030 goals as set out in the Paris Accord, et cetera, we actually need to look at the things that will deliver in the very short term. It's not about asset funding, it's about extension services, getting farmers the right knowledge to make the changes that they need today. So somehow we've got to, in this campus program, I think it's brilliant, we've got to get some emphasis on process change, implementation, access to finance to help extension services, which have been getting defunded across the world for the last several decades. It's time we reinvigorate that. If we want to make an immediate impact, that's what we can do. In the pilots we've run in East Africa, in less than nine months, we've been able to increase farmer income by 25%. We've increased yield by, sorry, farmer income by 29%, yield by 25%, and at the same time, We've reduced emissions by over 20% on an intensity basis. All of that was done through practice change, not through new technology, not through investment in new assets. And so for me, the biggest impact we can have in the short term is investing in that tr really practical transformation through practice change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donald. 
I give the floor now to the lady there. Yes, hi, I'm Neha Rai. I'm the private sector specialist working with Office of Climate Change uh, in uh, OCB here in FAO. I think one of the things which is quite important for this matchmaking platform is nuancing it to make it more uh, risk appetite worthy because what we're now assuming is that all farmers have low, high, uh, low risk and also all farmers are investment ready. So how do we make sure that there is a element of linking up the risk appetite of the funder with uh, low risk farmers. And if the farmers are not low risk, how do we make sure we have the right investment partnerships for risk sharing? And I think that is quite crucial for this kind of platform. Also, um, we know that the blended finance vehicles, which are currently working, they're mostly in emerging economies like Brazil and India also in very high value commodities like soy, palm oil, but not in millets or in uh, uh, underserved segments on low income countries. So this matchmaking platform really has to make sure that it sort of uh, match makes with the right type of uh, investment needs, which are not uh, only the business as usual, investors and investees coming together. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the main points. Otherwise, we will end up getting a lot of public funders, but no private funders in this matchmaking platform. And that's uh, one thing which I would like to flag. Thank you. Thank you very much. I give two more people the floor, and then we have to go to the shark tank. Yes. Um, again, all what we are all uh, talking about is, is the mode of implementation. And... Uh, I agree with the practical solutions that we need to to identify, and uh, and uh, we had a uh, FAO is very active in in uh, identifying climate smart agriculture practices that could be uh, developed into a business models. Uh, I had a, pro a project with uh, the regional office of uh, FAO with the, with Bo Damon, and the farmers are asking for practical uh, small scale technologies like solar water pumps, uh, small scale irrigation system, uh, planting and harvesting machines, insurancing. Those are very, very uh, simple technologies that the farmers need. And, and so uh, we can love much this, we can match it with the, with the private sectors uh, to upscale this into a business uh, enterprise. And uh, also, the, I will be talking about this afternoon, maybe about Asian CRN, and it is one of our activity is to love much. Yeah, uh, this activity uh, is as mentioned. Uh, we need to really match with international organizations, with private sectors. So, so I think, and and this, I, I feel like uh, I'm in a negotiation mode right now because. Uh, we are talking about, you know, what the mode of implementation. How can GAXA uh, helps to to so so how GAXA has this uh, a pool of knowledge as already mentioned a pool of knowledge and expertise. Then I think let's get the strength out of GAXA and and uh, put it into implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's certainly what we need to do. As a last speaker, also perhaps going to some of the issues, I give the floor to Oshani. Uh, thank you, Hans. Um, totally concurring with Donald and the private sector specialist at FAO. Nobody wants to fund processes where capital markets work on an asset base. We need the collateral. It's the asset that's valued. Absolutely. And Perhaps when you look at the cash flows of climate smart agriculture, where you do have a fairly long process of climate smart transformation or, or incubation, cash flows become very difficult. Hence why sometimes it's difficult to get blended finance directly into small scale farming. Uh, maybe the trick, and this is, again, 
uh, Donald, it'll be lovely to have your views on this at some point in the future. Maybe the trick would be to make nature and climate a part of the asset. And then financing processes will be an easy win. Back to you, Hans. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Oshani. I know for sure we have an intense road ahead. Thank you so much for laying out where we have to go. Now we go to our third program initiative, and that's about the youth and about how to get them started their business. And of course, we all know the program on, in I think in several countries, it's called the Shark Tank. I don't like sharks. I do, like dolphins much more. But the idea behind it is gave us inspiration. First, we think about ourselves a little bit, but then, and that's what Valentina briefly will present. But then we broaden it already because Don Cordero will take over in a much broader sense. Valentina, we'll start with you. Thank you very much, Chair, for giving me the for giving me the floor again. As you all know, for a variety of reasons, young farmers often have lack opportunities for starting their businesses and, of course, invest in climate smart agriculture. For this reason, okay, Gaxa would like to propose the, the, the Gaxa Shark Tank approach. So what is it? As you can see from the next slide, it will be a real competition where young entrepreneurs would like to showcase their businesses, models or proposal to some of the most successful expert people to receive their funds. The Shark Tank will be open not only to young farmers, but also to startups, cooperatives and also piloting landscapes in scaling CSA initiatives. So why we are proposing this, so the main core of GOXA is actually scaling up CSA best practices and promotes capacity building opportunities through a real and stimulus competition. Distinguished members, uh, it is my pleasure to inform you that the first pilot of the Shark Tank approach will be focused on the Africa region, given the specific climate sensitivities of multiple engines of grow, agriculture, natural capital and infrastructures in that region, which makes ramping up climate smart development at the scale across the continent an imperative. The Goxo Shark Tank approach will be held online in order to promote collaboration and participation on global, regional and country level. All applicants will be casted through a selection process by filling out an application form, which will be found online on the Goxo website once the casting call will be open. From the next slide, who will be the Shark Tank? Well, the juries will be composed by potential businesses, academics and government representative. Only shortlisted candidates will compete for the final prize according to the main challenges. So what would be really interesting of this Shark Tank approach and different from the other Shark Tank is basically that besides the funds, the winners will have the great opportunity to showcase their proposal during the next World Food Forum 2023 at the FAO headquarters and present the la latest improvement and receive the new Farm Hero of the Year Award during maybe the next annual forum. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you very much, Valentina. This is how we started with the idea uh, and how we sketched it. But then we came in contact with a very good friend of mine, but for, probably from for more of you, as John Cordera. And Cordera, Cordero, sorry, John, sorry. And um, he further picked it up, broadened it, and made it to uh, matured it more, much more. And John is the former special representative for food security of Mars. He has a broad network, also I would say a broad network in in, in businesses. And he further matured the idea. So for that, I will give the floor now to John. And then you see how we evolve from thinking to getting it into a practice with a partner. John, the floor is yours.
John, are you there? We see your slides. I'm working on it, Hans. Can you hear me? So clearly. So you can start your presentation. I'll start the presentation. Uh, to, to everyone there, this morning I feel like a farmer. I got up at 2.30 in the morning. I'm on the outer banks of uh, in North Carolina in the United States. So I am uh, six hours uh, behind you all. But I am pleased to share my perspectives on the launch of the Shark Tank approach. These three observations stimulated the slide that you now see there. And we're going to keep this slide up through the, present, through the presentation. First, despite the broad, broad array of global, national, and local public and private actions to address food systems, food insecurity continues to grow at greater and more alarming rates. Second, multiple interacting social, environmental, economic, and policy barriers impact the efforts to increase food production in order to deliver nourishing and affordable food to consumers. Third, my perspectives drawn from 55 years of development experience is that the proposed Shark Tank approach would only play a limited, narrow role to elevate young farmers and agri-entrepreneurs as pivotal game-changing players. In sum, I view this approach as disproportionate to the magnitude of the challenges. It represents a one and done without sustainability. I propose that GASA explore developing a broader platform and assemble a coalition of collaborating investors and donors committed to interacting with young farmers and agri-entrepreneurs on an ongoing basis. These ongoing interactions will include using multiple convening mechanisms to facilitate matching investment needs with specific capabilities and interests of investors' resources. Here are four illustrative samples that should characterize the investment coalition. Interact with a network of young entrepreneurs on an ongoing basis to identify and assess priority investment opportunities. Second, utilize in-person and virtual engagement venues to define the contours of investment needs and risk that will define the nature of investment opportunities. Next, share knowledge, broker, and help explore opportunities among potential investors who possess problem-solving capabilities and resources financial, in-kind, and institutional to commit investments likely to help resolve food insecurity problems. And finally, mentor young farmers and like-minded entrepreneurs to help organize their planning, thinking, and asking approaches. The members of the Investment Coalition should utilize a variety of mechanisms in their investment toolbox at appropriate forums to determine the match between needs and investment resources. Here are some examples that will help organically grow a network of young farmers and collateral agri-food industry leaders to sustain future generation. One is to communicate investment opportunities. Investors should listen and react to investment pitches. Investors and farmers should communicate alerts and awareness of specific investment needs. Investors should support online activities to promote global cooperation and collaboration among potential investors. And finally, attention should be given to last mile initiatives for investment support that should be spotlighted and explored. Another is to explore different coalition events. 
generate and encourage participation in contests such as the Shark Tank proposal and challenges for investments, awards, and recognitions, similar to the approach that uh, Valentina described. Second, offer platforms for farmers to showcase and demonstrate their business proposition. And finally, facilitate one-on-one -on -one meetings, introductions, and, and foot-in-the-door interactions among farmers and investments. Wrapping up, Oh, I should mention one other thing, educate. Facilitate expansive investment dialogue and knowledge exchange among young entrepreneurs and business leaders to enhance agri-food systems. Convene side events and workshops at conferences, trade shows, et cetera, for young farmers to appreciate the external policy context for investment opportunities in transforming food systems and their fit into such. Wrapping up, here are my suggested action items to support young farmers and allied agri-entrepreneurs with financial and institutional resources and investment tools and capabilities. First, initiate in a short-term basis the GASA Shark Tank proposal as a test to assess lessons learned. Then explore need and the value of co-creating an investment coalition with like-minded entities. Finally, keep young farmers actively engaged and informed with a steady flow of useful and timely science and business information. As you can see, what my, my single slide suggests is that on the left-hand side, there are challenges and problems that are most likely only going to be met by, by building a bridge with uh, investment mechanisms uh, through an investment coalition and building interactive mechanisms to be able to pursue collaboration among farmers, allied entrepreneurs, and uh, uh, potential investors. I leave you with three words, collaborate, invest, and nourish. And Hans, I'm looking forward to October in Rome, where I will be able to present a much more detailed uh, and specific set of proposals about how GASA can take this, this general concept forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, and also for being there so early in the morning but i think it's for all of us good sometimes to feel like a farmer to get up very early uh in the morning to do business but thank you so much and of course we continue to work with you because you matured already the starting ideas we had in a much more matured approach we work together because that's the idea of cox had to support and see where we're heading at and we are looking already forward to october november with that, I would like to give the floor to Charles Pellain. He's the director of the Wine Institute of the National University of Ireland, Galway. Wow, you have the floor. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and th very, thanks very much to the GAXA uh, initiative for the opportunity to uh, to present here today. Um, my, my name is Charlie Splann. I'm the director of the Interdisciplinary Rhine Institute at the University of Galway in Ireland, where we have a range of uh, research, innovation, and educational activities underway in climate smart agriculture. So uh, with the guidance of the, the GAXA Secretariat, I've, I've put together some slides to, for some reflections for the GAXA community in relation to the GAXA science approach and what can be achieved through ag on, uh, entrepreneurship approaches to scaling climate smart agriculture. So next slide. So as a preface to this, I think it's worthwhile for us to reflect on the scale of the uh, CSA scaling challenge that we face uh, across the three pillars of CSA. Um, on the food security side, we have 20% of the population of, of Africa facing hunger in 2021. Mm -hmm. Looking at emissions, we still have an agricultural system that is uh, responsible for a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. And then if we look at adaptation, uh, Fred has indicated the 600 million smallholders on the planet. Um, uh, smallholders um, 
are amongst the most acutely vulnerable to climate change impacts, and those impacts are um, accelerating essentially in terms of the um, the vulnerability of those farmers as we try to uh, deal with the climate change problem. And then if we look at the additionality of climate change, World Bank uh, studies are indicating that an additional 30 million uh, smallholders uh, will be exper experiencing extreme poverty by 2030 directly as a result of climate change. So, so in that context, um, it's, it's really important to consider what can be achieved from agri-entrepreneurship approaches, such as from the GAXA uh, Shark Tank approach. And really the key question here for me, and I think for all of us is, is how do we leverage agri-entrepreneurship to scale CSA innovations for food security, mitigation, adaptation? And how do we do that in the time scale that is necessary? And to do that, we really need to think a little bit about customers, consumers, beneficiaries, and end users, which may be synonymous in some cases, but not in all cases. Next slide. So coming back to the previous speakers, I think it's really important to realize what can be achieved from entrepreneurship approaches for scaling CSA, but also what cannot be achieved. And that it's really important given the scaling challenge that we need both public and private financing. And there are multiple channels of scaling CSA that need to be considered. If we look at entrepreneurship itself, indeed within that context, there are different routes and different types of entrepreneurs that we may consider. Um, we can consider startup agri-food companies, but also cooperatives that can aggregate as our previous speakers indicated. Then also we need to think about what the limitations of the startup community are. A lot of startups fail, a lot of startups fail to scale in the speed that we would need, but startups are important. And we should also consider existing SMEs who can add additional product lines and service lines um, and have, have potential for being also for scaling. So SMEs should not be forgotten in the, in the, um, in the private sector routes to scaling. The bigger kind of question, I suppose, for the startup community, and I've been at some workshops um, from FAO and the African Union uh, in relation to the availability of investments to scale startups, and that enabling environment is a really a major challenge. And like farmers learn in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, so also do entrepreneurs. And the types of entities that we should consider to weave into the GAXA entrepreneurship approach are incubators, accelerators, the types of entities that bring together entrepreneurs so they can learn from each other. And that's really important if we want to scale uh, CSA to entrepreneurship. Then we should also think a little bit about the social outcomes of entrepreneurship, um, rural employment, major challenge uh, facing uh, most rural areas globally, um, questions around empowerment, human capital, um, and also the question of what are, what are social entrepreneurship models. So all of that can be weaved into this in a sense. But then coming back to the, the question of the 600 million smallholder farmers, the, their effective uh, purchasing power of those farmers to be uh, attractors in terms of market demand is something we cannot um, ignore essentially. And so we really need innovative business models and and as indicated, um, as indicated, we really need to think about this last mile delivery models uh, in addition to other models. So there's a multiplicity of different types of farmers that we need to consider. So the, the enabling environment is important, but also the types of entrepreneurs we want to foster. And clearly on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see that just the complexity of climate finance and the different scales and levels of that, and clearly compasses and other enabling mechanisms are necessary to be able to navigate that for those that seek investment. Next slide. So clearly we need um, Shark Tank applicants. And if we look at the entrepreneurship landscape globally, there, there are thousands, tens of thousands of startups and in the agri-food agri uh, sector that are emerging all of the time. And for, to what extent the GAXA community can begin to kind of mobilize those and, and bring those within the GAXA, the GAXA fold. And the Shark Tank approach can, can help, I think, in, in that respect. Um, as, as Valentin indicated, you know, it's, it's a, it's an application process and bottom up, and that it has a range of um, objectives in terms of the impact uh, criteria expected from that. And clearly a prize and a global showcasing event and that relates to the World Food Pro Forum Pro in 2023 here in, here in the headquarters. Um, next slide. So the, the challenge as, as presented is organized around four cha challenges one of which is about sustainable and equitable increases in agricultural productivity and incomes. And again, any applicants that are applying to the Shark Tank uh, should really think about what's the evidence that they can deliver agri-productivity or agri-income increases. 
what farmers are they tar targeting, what value chains can they impact upon. The second challenge looks at resilience, the question around adaptation. And again, the outcomes we, we all know, but how do you measure increases in resilience? How do you measure increases in resilient livelihoods? So the evidence to attract investment would need to be there. And that's a challenge, I think, for the entire community. Then thirdly, we've got the mitigation question about reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Again, measurement is easier in that context, but again, where what types of innovations can be scaled to entrepreneurship that would lead to the largest reductions and fastest reductions in a certain period of time. Then the more social outcomes like gender transformative or social inclusion. Again, questions around measurement, which females, and if we're really interested in, in you know, reaching the furthest behind those types of narratives, um, the questions around elite capture of, um, so what type of impacts and who are the beneficiaries of agri-entrepreneurship approaches are worth thinking through. Next slide. So these were just some, some reflections for Shark Tank applicants. Um, really questions like how innovative is your idea? And many people have ideas, but really what's in what people invest in or what investors invest in are execution plans. They also invest in teams, not individuals. And clear leadership and role definition within teams is really important. And those teams should have complementary skills. Uh, so ideally people with finance, and agricultural and innovation knowledge, we have higher odds of being invested in essentially. And then we have, if we look at Julius and, um, and Alexandre, they've been developing a minimal viable product. And um, again, for applicants to, to the Shark Tank approach, do they have something that is a minimal viable product that should deliver, um, have evidence that it will deliver benefits for end users? Are they refining that with end user and customer feedback? And do they have indeed any initial customers that would validate their, their, their innovation? But key to all of this is really what's the business model. And I think from a GAXA perspective, the business models of startups, you know, the ambition of those business models and how they can get to the scale that is necessary within the time scale is, is a, something that really needs to be taken into account as to what can be achieved through um, entrepreneurship. So what scale can be reached by the business model and in what time frame? And that comes down to numbers and numbers of customers, beneficiaries and end users, and really is the scale of uh, the ambition of an, a startup and its business model efficient to, some, to impact on the challenge topic. These are things to just reflect upon. And really there's a lot of tools like entrepreneurship itself. Every country promotes entrepreneurship. There's lots of tools and supports for startups, um, whether in agriculture or in IT, it's all pretty much the same type of processes. And there's lots of tools for that. One important kind of thing to think through is the differentiation between uh, customers who are those who pay for the product or service and users, those who experience it. And so as Fred indicated, you know, the, the products are, are the services that farmers experience as users have to be evidence-based they have to deliver impact. But in the case of smallholders, it may be the case that they're not the people who pay for those. There are others that could pay for them and the users. So we, we can think through the kind of differentiation there. And then coming to the final point about champions and heroes, um, the whole scale of the CSA um, challenge is really some, in some sense, a kind of a heroic challenge. And we, the GAXA community has within it um, many heroes and champions of climate smart agriculture and climate smart agriculture scaling. And really an important, um, function of GAXA is to profile and showcase and enable those heroes so that they become, that they, they, they attract more attention and it's, we, we're demonstrating what can be achieved within the timescale. So it's really great that the Shark Tank winner would be invited to the GAXA annual forum, but also um, have an opportunity within the World uh, Food Forum to um, showcase their activities. So really that, that's it from me. Our university, we've been working for about the past 10 years with the Climate Smart, the C CCAPS program and CGIR. We run a master's program on climate change, agriculture and food security. We have other masters on agri-entrepreneurship and sustainability and so forth. And we're really keen to, to work with GAXA, um, particularly in relation to e-learning, entrepreneurship, and we're also connected, we run the Cliff Grads PhD Fellowship Program with the Global Research Alliance on Greenhouse Gases. So we're very excited to be here and, and thank you all. Thank you very much, Charles. And we are also very excited that you are here. Also because of your presentation, also showing sometimes it looks so easy to have a competition for startups, but you showed us what needs to be done to make it successful. So 
you can be assured that we we would like to continue working with you and John to further mature this idea to bring it into practice. And as a last speaker, we have already a winner of an, I would say more or less Shark Tank approach. It's great to have you here. Josfat Mokaya, he's from Tanzania. And he was the Agri Tanzania Hackathon winner from the last edition. It's great to have you here. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hans. Um, I first of all want to say I'm not really from Tanzania, but I'm from Kenya. Uh, I took part. Uh, it's good to see you, Margaret. So uh, I, I took part in the Agri Hackathon experience that happened uh, between uh, November 2nd to November 4th last year, which was organized by Dominico from the Climate Social Forum and uh, of course, uh, Tanzania Conservation Voices. I think that is why uh, the Agri Hackathon is called for Tanzania. So I first of all, um, happy, thank you for inviting me to this forum. It's really a great honor and uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm participating. So what I want to do first is to tell you what the Agri Hackathon experience was like, what we did. Uh, now, having listened to the speakers, I, I think uh, this morning we have handled capacity building, we have handled the campus funding program. Now, if you ask me what, what I have noticed is that what we did in the Agri Hackathon experience is actually a, a taste of uh, what GATSA plans to do. So uh, it was based on three Cs that was uh, create, connect and collaborate. Uh, so there were a series of webinars that were arranged. We created teams, we collaborated and of course uh, we got a chance to connect now not only uh, for startups but also for other youth uh, and even research organization. So uh, I was part of one team, okay? And, and, and this team presented an idea which, which, which actually won. And one thing that, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so th these are the challenges that uh, came up during the, the, the webinar series. We were to bring out ideas on any of those, women in agriculture, mechanization of farming and allied activities, all those six. So uh, uh, part of our team, what, what, what exactly we were doing was uh, we chose one of the challenges and uh, we presented the idea. And of course, this idea was uh, presented to a panel of judges. That is now the Shark Tank approach I was talking about. And uh, some of the things, go to uh, slide five, some of the things that the judges were looking at, just go to slide five, please. Next and the next one. Thank you. So what, what was happening when we were presenting the ideas, the judges were looking at whether the idea was uh, climate smart, the idea was feasible, was it innovative, was the idea uh, scalable and uh, was there teamwork? So one of my team members who unfortunately did not make it is from India. So you can see how we collaborated. The webinar brought me from Kenya and a team member called Kushi from India. So we discussed and we decided to present the idea uh, that won. Now, next, next slide, please. The next one. Thank you. So this is the idea that one, I, I, I just want to just tell you about the idea. Then there will be a video that will come up after this of uh, those who participated and the winning teams. So this is the idea. Basically, uh, it is uh, from team BCH1. And uh, I was with uh, Kushi from uh, India. And uh, we presented, the idea is just uh, a multi-story garden technology uh, with customized drip irrigation. So th those photos are just uh, uh, showing you a glimpse of the idea. 
I, I feel I have a lot to tell you, but I, I'll restrict myself to what is there. So it's a vertical farming technology and uh, it has uh, uh, six stories. So this idea uh, is basically promoting vertical farming and efficient use of water, which is very scarce. And of course, efficient use of uh, land, which uh, especially the region I come from, I come from uh, Western Kenya, a place called Kisi, and uh, we are really growing in population and uh, land for farming is not there. So farmers need to be innovative. Farmers need to practice uh, uh, farming that will help them multiply their production at the same time, making sure that they're conserving water and at the same time, making sure that they're using land more sustainably. So uh, it's a, a technology that uh, multiplies the available space by up to 10 times. And of course, uses uh, very little water per week, which is uh, 40 liters. And uh, we, we also support farmers with the basic uh, agronomic trainings on especially what to plant on those gardens. And uh, that drip irrigation is, uh, you can use it for uh, promoting irrigation, which, which is not so much advanced, something that can be used by the smallest of the farmers down there, the smallholder farmers. And just what, what has been happening is that we have really said that farmers are the unsung heroes, the smallholder farmers. We believe this technology is going to help them use water, uh, efficiently and of course use the land that is available most uh, efficiently. So uh, we strongly believe that uh, our women and youth in, in East Africa and Africa in general can turn around their financial incomes if they take up various farming enterprises, including, including the primary production of these horticultural crops, of course, through this technology. So one of the things that uh, we really propose is that it's this this technology can uh, perhaps be like one case study that perhaps Gaksa can take up and uh, maybe do a research and quantify data from this. Like, is it uh, possible to multiply production from this technology so that as as we uh, promote this going forward, it will be backed up by data and information. So. I would uh, like you to watch the video of the participants and the winning teams uh, so that you just appreciate what happened during the Agri Hackathon experience. So please, you, you can play the video. My name is Josephat Mukaya and I'm from Kenya. I was part of uh, his team BCH1. Uh, I'm glad our solution won. We, we proposed the idea of uh, uh, multi-story gardens, which, which is actually essentially uh, vertical farming. So, and uh, we also proposed uh, some customized drip irrigation for the vertical farming and also efficiently use water in the face of the climatic changes that we have. No more. Mark. Do the bridges. 
from the Good Young Farmers Enterprise at the 2022 edition of the IG Hackathon, we presented an idea called Unlocking Potential or simply App. Unlocking Potential is a project with a goal to improve our country's agricultural value chain by setting up agri support centers in rural communities to help smallholder farmers increase productivity by building on their capacity. Teaching farmers how to maximize on space to produce large volumes using natural systems and also helping them to expand their businesses by connecting them to funding opportunities. Agri Hackathon provided us with a platform to build on our idea and find ways to actualize it. Through the mentorship program, we have been able to develop a business model, ecosystem Canva, and transaction board. The process of creating these canvas opened our minds to understand how we can properly establish our idea as a business. We are here from Jerry from Environmental Management Trust in Zimbabwe. I'm a member of the Agriaton team, BCH6, together with the Boniface Posse from the World Youth Development program in Kenya. So we are proposing to do a project on a ecological organic agriculture and its impacts in income generation, food and nutrition security in the vulnerable rural households in Kenya and Zimbabwe. The trust or the novelty of the project is that we are taking organic agriculture and also applying some ecosystem-based principles whereby we are using nature-based solutions to deal with the climate change and its adverse impacts on agriculture in the two countries. Now, the experience in Agri Hackathon has, been, has really been nice. Uh, I, I want to thank Dominic for helping us through uh, writing the business plan uh, using the BMC model. And I want to thank my, also my team member, who is Kushi. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you very much. With this, I give one or two speakers the possibility to react because we are pressed for time and we have to go to the regional alliances. So if there are one or two reactions, please do, but very brief, please. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Michael from Nigeria. Um, just a commendation for the presenters. I was able to learn a lot and I believe that Gaza will continue with this process. The paper was of quality, the mode of interactions, the sharing of experiences, and answering of the questions. So in every aspect of that, I will propose for a working group to be set up so that we can be able to harmonize what has been discussed and so that we can be able to move Gaza forward. And I also love the way the chair of able to chairman the process and the quality of the venue was excellent. It has been my dream to come to FPO for almost 10 years ago. And I want to thank you for making it to be possible. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. We certainly come back to you. I Let's go now to the regional alliances because we further developed this idea together with uh, John and Charles, uh, because we made clear how to do it now. Uh, we learned from already the practice, but now I invite Fred to sit here and Dana's going to introduce. Fred, you sit here. Oh, oh. All right. So I think we've, we've heard so many exciting ideas and I'm very excited for the future of GAXA moving forward with all these, um, innovations that we have presented here but i get some comments asking who's going to do this who's going to who's going to help gaxa implement this and i think we should not forget the regional alliances 
which is really the powerhouse partners or the main running engine of the alliance. And so at this point, we really need to meet them again and see them again, the regional alliances, right, Fred? And it is my pleasure to introduce Fred's session in which we learn from we learn from the regional alliances, which, as I said, is the main running engines of, of GAXA, and were also one of our alliances where I play a pivotal role in the development of within the Southeast Asian nation. So, Fred, without further ado, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mirla. And Sorry. <laughs> thank you both chairs to, for the opportunity, but I also want to thank uh, Valentina and Federica for, for helping us uh, address this program as well. I've got three, three slides, uh, just real quickly, uh, if we can bring them up. Are they available? It's coming up. They're not? It's a little bit slow. It's coming up, right? If not, I can go on. Well, we're waiting for the first slide. If, we're, if not, let's... If not, I can go. Yeah. Okay. And we'll keep the slide on. Well, one of the things that, uh, that happened with, you know, I've been around since the beginning of GAXA. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is, you know, when you say climate smart agriculture, um, it started with us. I mean, yeah. and now uh, back in the United States, uh, everybody's talking about climate smart agriculture. But I think it's really important that we own the the language and, and make make sure it means the same thing wherever we go. Yeah. So uh, a few things that we're doing in North America. Uh, I'm I'm the chair of the North American Climate Smart Ag Alliance, and and what we're we're trying to do at this particular uh, session here is is learn what each um, uh, alliance or region is going out there and that we can maybe learn from each other. I think just, just my own opinion, uh, I think it's probably the, the most underused, uh, uh, thing that we have. There we go. This is NAXA, uh, next, next slide. And this is what, when we, when we tried to put the objectives of what NAXA was trying to be, was we wanted to help inform and educate agriculture forestry leaders of all the potential of climate change, equip producers and the tools and knowledge they need to make the right decisions, mobilize producers to advocate for the need and changes of that light. And then, okay, we'll move on. This, this, the third one is, this is my favorite slide when we, we put this together for, for NAXA and it, it really is um, the very, very, it's a very busy one, but you'll see the three circles which overlap and that represents the, uh, the three pillars of climate smart ag agriculture, the, the adaptation and resiliency uh, is the middle one. But the, we, you know, if you begin with number one and number two and end up with number three, it's, it's got to be in the right order. So farmers will respond to productivity and we, we like to call it sustainable intensification. How do we get more out of our land in a better way? And then, then we have to adapt and how do we make our our soils more resilient? How do we make uh, the adjustments to uh, the changing climate? And that's where soil health comes in. And that's one of the things that's really, really uh, enlightening. The farmers are now paying attention to soil health more than they ever did before. And I think that is great. We always, our land grant universities have always told us how to grow a, a, a profitable crop, but, but we don't, we know, hadn't been paying attention to what's happening below the soil surface. Now we are, we know the, uh, the value of that. But as the climate has changed, we've got to figure out ways that we can use water better and nutrients better and lots of different things. But then when we do number one and number two, then all of a sudden number three, the greenhouse gas reduction happens automatically. So when you go talk to a farmer and want to talk about uh, climate smart agriculture, you have to you know, couch your, your, your uh, request in a much different way. Farmers at one time was it's very hard to even convince them there was climate change. Well, now that we know that, that they, would, they would admit that the, the weather patterns have changed, but we don't believe in climate change. Well, now we know the climate is changing. But in, in the States, we have a lot of issues with water quality and nutrient management because the nutrients go off. So what's, what's interesting is you get farmers interested in, in uh, water quality and 
those same practices will help in climate smart agriculture. So it's important to 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 talk to the farmer through the lens he's he's looking at his land. And if you do that, then all of a sudden he becomes a a, a real source of of, of change in, in agriculture. But um, the, th the some of the things that we're doing in, in NAXA as far as uh, in a regional way is uh, yeah, was um, we use cover crops, we use no-till, uh, you see biodigesters that are uh, springing up. And, and one of the things that we've heard a couple of times in the last two days is the circular economy or bioeconomy that that really helps farmers uh, understand better ways to to use things that we normally would have called waste products in the past, but recirculate them back in and and have a valuable uh, contribute contribution to to what they were doing. Some of the other things that that we are doing is uh, using innovation and technology. Lots of lots of things that are happening uh, that that you can when you implement some innovations such as uh, precision agriculture as far as planting. And using technologies such as uh, um, artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, you can do some things on a on a on a way that that it's it's really size neutral. We we have a in my own Ohio State University, there's there's programs that they're using to uh, use robotics going clear down to a small unit like uh, like even two meters wide, and and have these small robotic uh, operated. Uh, planters in the field and, and they also uh, sprayers that you can only spray the weeds and have an 80 percent savings in, in, uh, in, in the, the chemistry that you use plus the fact that uh, you know you only fertilize in, in ways that are, are to, to whatever point, points in the, in the field that need it so these are some of the things that we're doing but I'd really like to hear from some of the other um, regions uh, Okay, we got a couple of them here. We got Dr. Margaret Yovantana. Is she here? Okay, would you like to go first? Chair. Of the she's Aussie she's the chair of the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network. Yes. So please, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. So um, the ASEAN Climate uh, Resilience Network, or ASEAN CRN was uh, conceptualized since 2013 and endorsed by the ASEAN Ministers of Agriculture and Cooperatives, uh, Agriculture and Forestry, or AMAP, in 2014. So it is now 10 years old. And uh, the ASEAN CRN composed of 10 association, uh, 10 uh, member states of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN is a platform for regional exchange, particularly for sharing information, experiences and expertise on climate smart agriculture. And since its, its establishment in 2014, the ASEAN CRN has successfully and vigorously launched activities that aim to ensure adaptation of the agriculture sector to climate change and optimize its mitigation potential. So by now, the ASEAN CRN has facilitated countless partnerships, collaborations, coordination, personal and uh, professional linkages. So mindful of the time, I would just like to give you some glimpse of uh, our priorities in which we are mobilizing resources for implementation right now. First is the transformation of low emissions and resilient agri-food system. Uh, uh, an, a knowledge exchange event and climate policy negotiation training, which was held in Bali uh, last year. Another knowledge event is the Pathways to Net Zero for Agri-Food and Land Use Systems in Asia, uh, held uh, December last year in Bangkok. We regularly uh, hold an ANGA virtual by the way, ANGA is the ASEAN Negotiating Group on Agriculture. Uh, uh, we hold a virtual workshop. Uh, and also, now our mile, mile, uh, milestone actually is the, the, uh, the first of a kind of a multi-country uh, proposal from the Green Climate Fund on Agriculture Readiness Grant 
and it was launched in COP27 in Sharm Al Sheikh in Egypt. And the uh, readiness grant for the enhanced climate finance and implementation of Coronivia Joint Work on Agriculture, uh, which was finally approved and launched at the Thai Pavilion in COP27 and now ready for kickoff uh, to start the implementation. I just like to highlight actually the during our uh, workshop in Bali, we uh, we really paved the way, paved the road to a resilient uh, to to a resilient and low emission ASEAN agriculture, and we envision ASEAN agriculture by 2050 as a resilient, biodiverse, and pollution free agri-food system that provides healthy and nutritious food for all in the ASEAN region. And we have identified uh, four triggers of change. First is the integrated approach, coordination and political will. Second is the strengthening the policy, financial support and spread awareness and understanding of climate change. Third is the institu institutionalized and binding ASEAN climate policy and action. And the fourth is scientific knowledge sharing and capacity building. I would also like to mention the 11 transformative actions and enabling conditions. First is the food system transformation action involving, involving all stakeholders, multi-stakeholder program steering committee, global alliance on climate change. Third is on investment in research and development, strengthening stakeholder participation, sustainability framework, guiding action of public and private entities, strengthening data generation management and use, sustainable finance, effective implementation and sustainability, elect national champion or key officials, awareness of stakeholders through capacity building, advocacy, regional guidelines, identify success story from the region, link national guidelines, to regional <laughs> guidelines. And so Mr. Chairman, um, uh, these are the views from the 10 ASEAN member states. And uh, we, we try to uh, put it in, uh, in our work plan. And hopefully GAXA could partner with us. In every, uh, every ASEAN CRN meeting, we try to, we call it love much. So we invite uh, international organizations, partners, FAO, uh, CGR. So hopefully that GAXA will be uh, uh, will be involved in our future meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for your comments. Uh, if we can, if we can have the regional reports, can we keep it to maybe three minutes? Because we, we are, you got some? Fred, just to uh, give you a couple of more specific examples of the work, the outputs of NAXA, which I think is, really an example of why the regional alliances are so important. The 70 farm organizations that are part of NAXA spent a lot of time on enabling policy, and they forged consensus on 50 enabling policy recommendations that were advanced to, at least in the United States, to the U.S. Congress. The bulk of those were adopted, and yesterday you heard Terry Cosby describe the resources that he now has, the $20 billion, U.S. billion dollars that the U.S. government has made available for climate smart agriculture. That was one of the primary outputs of NAXA, that we identified that as a need, and then we went and advocated for it, and the policymakers adopted it. So that's an example of enabling policy action. Second is the work that the NAXA members did in the climate convention in the Cornivia Joint Work on Agriculture. They had eight submissions that they introduced over the course of, I think, three years. And the core guiding principles that the NAXA members backed, along with other partners in the farmer organizations around the world, uh, including your region and others, ended up in <clears throat> the Sharm el Sheikh agreement that came out of this long drawn out process that people thought was gonna collapse and agriculture would be left on the cutting room floor. 
at the 11th hour, literally, of COP27. We made it in there because our collective voices showed up. So that's really, I think, an example of us working together on enabling policy. On knowledge sharing, boy, there's so much that could be done. We have limited resources. So what we've chose to do is put out a quarterly newsletter that hopefully uh, all of you or most of you are on our mailing list to see it, where we just try to share examples of innovation and experimentation that the members are or pursuing. And occasionally we do a webinar. And <clears throat> I think those would be just a couple of examples that I would lift up of how a regional alliance, once you get the voice of the farmers and our value chain partners lifted up and pointed in the right direction, they can have really profound outcomes. So hopefully there's other examples where together we're all doing the same thing and getting similar outcomes. Well, thank you for that, Ernie. But the, the one thing that we uh, have also is we, we have a weekly update from from you and and for the solution from the land, but the, all of the things that are happening in, in Naxa as well. So let me give you the the, the floor, Emilda. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to support um, Dr. Margaret's presentation and also to mention that the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network is already working and is a member of GAKSA. And in fact, um, we came, I think, as one of the, we were highlighted as one of the best practices out there of how a regional alliance work in the second or third year of GAKSA's annual forum. And GAKSA has helped supported our independent regional dialogues for the Food System Summit. And um, it's it's just uh, so bad that we couldn't show some of the slides that's happening in the region where we have knowledge exchange events right on the beach where it's exciting um, or in the mountains. So because we wanted to get more global partnership through GAXA and um, also um, to also compare with Ernie's um, uh, intervention or sharing, it's very mirroring similarly what's happening with the Southeast Asian Alliance or the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network. Um, in terms of policy, we had really such concrete output in which we have pushed for the ASEAN negotiating group for agriculture. This is quite a big deal because agriculture was seen as a negotiation at the COP processes were really seen as the domain of the ministries of environment and for most of our countries when we came into the four we were really questioned as to what is the agriculture sector trying to do so imagine the layers of bureaucracy that we need to get through in order to get the right recognition and finally as being recognized as a new negotiating group under the g77 in china was really quite a big deal even though we have no pictures to show. And in, in terms also of a financial uh, addressing the bottleneck of finance, we went ahead and try and, and successfully got the Green Climate Fund in order to accelerate investments for the transformation of the agri-food system and capacity building. We've come up with so many policy tools promoting CSA also in partnership with GAFSA. So we're very happy with that. But the main reason we wanted to share these experiences is we wanted to get more global partners together with uh, GAFSA's facilitation of these partnerships. Thank you, Miller. One of the things that that is really uh, prevalent with with GAXA is, and, and as we go together with these with these regionals, is we can have uncommon collaboration. You know, if we keep our eyes and on on the on the prize, and that is uh, you know climate smart agriculture and the things we can do. There's many many players that can come in and help, uh, and some some groups that you may not even uh, think about joining. One of the things I thought of, of is is we have a, a a new system in the United States called Starlink, where you have a broad broadband uh, Wi-Fi in in places that that you don't normally have, and it's really important to to move some of these things along. Next, we have Mohammed Musa and the regional uh, for Central Africa. Would you like to have the floor? Mohammed? 
Bonjour. Uh, there we go. Yes. Ed, you have the floor. Okay. Merci bien et bonjour à tous. Uh, excellent forum. Désolé de n'avoir pas pu être avec vous uh, à Rome, monsieur Arel, pour des circonstances un peu compliquées. Uh, je m'appelle Moussa Moussa, je suis de nationalité tchadienne et résident à Ndjamena au Tchad. Je suis de l'Alliance régionale Afrique centrale. Donc, euh, comme ça a été dit, donc, euh, aussi en tant qu'Alliance régionale, euh, on, depuis un an, nous avons essayé de, de mettre en œuvre des activités, on avait fait des planifications. Et aujourd'hui, nous avons soumis un document sur des consultations régionales en Afrique centrale, une, euh, des consultations qui permettront vraiment de, de, de définir un peu les défis et euh, le développement du secteur de l'agriculture en compte, des défis notamment face aux aléas, face des changements climatiques. Donc, euh, c'est des consultations qui permettront vraiment, euh, des consultations qui permettront vraiment de, de comprendre Excuse, excuse me. Could could you the the voice your voice is not coming over very. It's very hard to interpret. Can you uh, maybe clear clear it up a little bit and, and maybe slow down and speak very clear. Comme je disais, c'est un c'est un peu mieux. Et comme je, je disais, je suis euh, mon salle et mon salle, je suis de l'Afrique centrale et de l'Alliance régionale Afrique centrale, je suis de nationalité tchadienne. Et pour GAXA Afrique centrale, nous avons prévu de faire des consultations régionales, un peu avec, toutes les, avec tous les pays membres de, de l'Afrique centrale pour, sur les défis et les perspectives de du développement du secteur de l'agriculture euh, face aux aléas et face des changements climatiques. Donc, cela permettra de, de mettre vraiment sur la table de toutes les difficultés que l'agriculture rencontre et aussi euh, de trouver des, des solutions idoines et adéquates qui nous permettront vraiment de pallier face aux aléas du changement, du changement climatique. C'est un projet que nous avons soumis, mais malheureusement, comme on était dans les préparatifs du, du forum, ça n'a pas, pas abouti. Mais euh, nous comptons vraiment le faire euh, d'ici très bientôt. Euh, après le forum, nous allons échanger avec l'équipe de facilitation de GAXA pour vraiment sa mise en œuvre. Donc, euh, ça serait vraiment l'occasion pour tous les pays de l'Afrique centrale de définir vraiment les difficultés qu'ils rencontrent et ensemble de trouver des moyens adéquats. Et aussi, qui sera aussi des partages euh, des meilleures pratiques, en fait. Aujourd'hui, bon, il y a quelques pays qui ont quand même un peu, un peu réussi euh, pour faire face aux changements climatiques avec des innovations technologiques, avec l'agriculture les, 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 de précision ou même euh, un peu les systèmes d'irrigation goutte à goutte et l'agriculture intelligente. Donc, euh, voilà un peu euh, nos, nos ambitions. Par ailleurs, je suis aussi le coordonnateur du pays du Global Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network. Donc, c'est le réseau euh, des jeunes qui est aussi en phase avec euh, les activités de GAXA. Et je suis aussi responsable d'un incubateur, Smart Village, qui est aussi dans le domaine des innovations technologiques pour une agriculture intelligente. Donc, globalement, c'est un peu ça, quelques éléments que je voudrais partager avec, euh, avec, avec l'équipe. Merci. Thank you very much. Now we have Justice Vita, the or the Southern African region. You have the floor. Um, so thank you, Chair. I have posted. Uh, hello. Thank you, Chair. I've posted um, my presentation on the on the, uh, on the chat because uh, of uh, poor network connection. So you can just read 
uh, on the group chat, on the, on the meeting chat. Hello? Hello? Justice, we don't have your presentation. Can you share? The... Yeah, I've shared it. I have shared your read on the chat. You can just read on the chat because. Please be very quickly. Thank you. And brief. No, I'm saying you can read it on the chat because there's poor mutual connection this side. I put it on the chat. Okay. Can you share the the what you put in the chat? Thank you. All right. Okay. Right. Um, about SACSA, in line with the African Climate Smart Agriculture Vision 2525, which aims to support at least 25 million farm households in participating um, through in Climate Smart Agriculture by 2025. In 2018, the Southern Africa Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance was formed, launched in Maputo, and, and um, we are actually focusing on quite a lot of issues. So, uh, we see provide a multi-order platform for facilitating uh, peer exchange and learning, building a common understanding of climate smart agriculture, and aligning harmonized various climate change and agricultural programs being undertaken across the Southern Africa region and multi uh, scales. Uh, more specifically, uh, Southern Africa Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance seeks to foster Climate Smart um, Agriculture Partnerships, Alliances, and Networks um, uh, programs by enabling access to information on financing and opportunities, support a more coherent approach to formulating national climate change and agriculture policy frameworks such as NAPS, NDCs, NAPS, ETC. And then our key guiding principles are is to accelerate the scaling up of climate smart agriculture uh, by uh, following uh, key principles. Number one, diverse and inclusive networking and networking platforms uh, that provide an usual space for dialogue, consultations, and knowledge sharing. Uh, second bullet, broker and catalyze partnerships for the development, scaling up, and determination of innovative evidence-based options for climate smart agriculture, third bullet facilitating sharing information and experience technologies, knowledge and practices on diverse climate smart agriculture approaches at all levels, taking holistic integrated cross-sectoral and, um, and indigenous peoples and recognizing that small holders, including farmers, livestock keepers, fishers, and forests are the most vulnerable to climate change. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. And um, we also, sorry, the last bullet. We intend to leverage on multi stakeholder institutions on problem solving, knowledge generation, brokering, or commissioning multi um, institutional studies, analysis, and research, uh, documenting best practice, experience, and lessons. I think this has been emphasized to all the sessions starting yesterday and today. There was a uh, an emphasis on this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Divine Inchcom for the youth. You've got the floor. Yeah. Hello, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? No. Oh, Justice, we cannot hear you. Is it Johnny? No, oh, there are many rumors behind you. Oh. Much background noise. Can you eliminate that? Yes. Can you hear me now? There's too much background noise. We can't, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? So many people. Yeah. Can, you, can you stop the background? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? That's better. That's better. Go ahead. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm so delighted to be here. 
and uh, I'm intervening concerning the, the alliance, the various regional alliance. I just want to say that uh, CSAYN, of course, we, we, we support in the Secretary of the Opposition Unit to make sure that this alliance has strengthened. And uh, Mohammed that just spoke is one of our members from Chad. And we have visited ourselves to make sure that uh, CSAYN works hand in gloves with YAPSA in the sense that we have a very broad and large outreach. So it's easy for us to implement this across board. And for this reason, we'll be working very closely with the Secretariat or the Pacific Unit to, to rule out the alliances in other continents that we are not so far. Thank you very much indeed. And we are planning together with uh, the various uh, uh, team, uh, Secretariat members here at CSYN to rule out the GAFSA agenda across all our programs. Because GAFSA actually is one of our flagship programs. We have decided to take it as one of our flagship programs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, you know, some, some thinking we probably should uh, maybe recognize, there, are there some regions that are working closer with other regions? Is there any reports of that? Clyde, would you want to say something? Anybody in the room, yes. Anybody here or even online, uh, if you have something to report to, from another region way, we'd like to hear that. Uh, yeah, so uh, Canada is part of the North American Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance. Uh, Fertilizer Canada is a, is a, is a member. Um, but we've been certainly doing a lot of work to collaborate between our African project and what's going on in uh, Canadian agriculture. Uh, and uh, we've had uh, over, I think, uh, a dozen technical sessions between uh, leaders in uh, academic and extension world in Africa and, uh, and uh, Canadian uh, institutions as well. So, you know, in Canada, the federal government has set a, uh, an NDC of a 30% absolute reduction in uh, in fertilizer or nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer use. Um, and uh, that's been a very uh, aggressive uh, target. We've been working with the government on uh, how to try and at least move towards that by the target of 2030. Uh, and the federal government has set up a, a subsidy program for farmers to access uh, BMP technology. Uh, but in Africa, where uh, it's a very different scenario where uh, currently fertilizer use in Africa is about eight kilograms per uh, hectare, um, which is a fraction of what a, a normal uh, farm would use in a developed country. Uh, the African Union in 2006 set a target at Abuja to increase that fertilizer use from six, from eight uh, kilograms to 50, which is a more or less a five-fold increase. So the issue in, in Africa related to fertilizer is, is that the African uh, continent uh, fulfills its promise to increase yields and product production, which is critically important, not only to food security, but to um, uh, uh, the development of the economies of uh, African countries, there will be a corresponding increase in nitrous oxide emissions. So it's critically important that we move now to get best management practices and what we advocate for our program, which is what's used in North America, uh, to limit the growth in those emissions. Um, and we think we can have a significant impact in flattening the curve, which is a phrase that was used a lot during COVID-19, and reduce a lot of the emissions that would occur unless um, uh, farmers uh, have better systems for uh, managing their fertilizer and use. And I think that is a massively critical uh, challenge. I'm less sort of aware on livestock, except I know that there is a push for more and more confinement agriculture in, uh, in Africa, um, particularly in terms of uh, chicken uh, and other um, poultry. And again, that is a challenge related to um, uh, to uh, to emissions. So I think that there's some very significant um, challenges in Africa, but that's due to the need for Africa to catch up after you know a century of lagging so far behind the rest of the world in its agricultural productivity. Thank you, Clyde, for that. Does anybody else have a 
an item they would like to share that they're, they're working with another region? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I have one question. I, I hear uh, uh, what you just said, and I, I do agree with uh, definitely that we need to, to improve the way of different uh, continent uh, in their own agriculture. But I also would like to understand better how, um, how this uh, need that you were stating about improving uh, the accessibility of uh, fertilizer in Africa, which is very much lower than other continents, can fit well with the, some of the projects that we hear with that they were even actually increasing their uh, their productivities. We just hear uh, from the winner of the Shark Tank, tank of last year with organic, uh, an organic approach. Because my, my question is a bit larger here. It, it will be interesting to hear about the discussion, but at the same time, I think it's a great opportunity. The fact that GAXA is including different stakeholders and a variety of approaches. Um, but I also would like to understand better how these different approaches of different companies, organizations, and NGOs with similar goals are actually planning to work together and to collaborate because I, I think that the key word we're using is uh, enabling environment collaboration, uh, but I also would like to understand how this will work. And this is also a question that's coming because in, uh, in our own organization, uh, we are having similar discussions because we are promoting um, an agroecological approach, a climate smart agricultural approach for rice cultivation, system of rice intensification, which is practiced by a varieties of farmers. Some of them are organic, some of them are not. And we would like to understand better how the collaboration between these different uh, views, different people can bring um, a constructive uh, discourse. So that's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so fertilizer is food for plants. Um, it is the, and the, 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 you can get fertilizer using uh, uh, processes that we have. You, we can mine it from deposits, uh, but we can also take the nitrogen from the air. We're all breathing nitrogen right now, capture it and uh, turn it into a granular uh, fertilizer. Um, but the, the major other source of nutrients for plants in the world is manure from cattle and chicken and hogs and other uh, livestock. And the challenge the world faces is there is not enough livestock in the world to produce enough manure to fertilize all the crops. So, for example, in Canada, which has one of the most uh, productive crop systems in the world, uh, only about 10% uh, of the nutrient needs for crops actually comes from manure. And even though we have very intensive livestock operations in Canada, we don't produce enough manure uh, to uh, fertilize all the crops, and that's the deficit. It's, it's similar in Africa, uh, where they simply don't have enough manure um, to uh, grow all their crops without the use of fertilizer. The foreign nutrient stewardship system that we have developed uses can be used for either manure or fertilizer or both used together. So our position would be that uh, the first thing a farmer should do is see if he has access to manure. If he does, then use that. But it's probably not going to be enough to properly fertilize his crops, and therefore he's probably going to, to have really productive uh, crop production to uh, utilize fertilizer as uh, as well. And two, when you look at Africa, there's a lot of grazing systems. So there's cattle in broad uh, uh, settings on uh, the savanna, and you can't collect the manure from those systems. It's extremely difficult to do that. So um, there are significant challenges, but there's no reason that fertilizer cannot work hand in hand with manure. There's benefits to both, and uh, that's uh, I think something we we where we can collaborate with everyone in in systems uh, to uh, produce better productivity. Thank you, Clyde. We got time for one more speaker. That's online is Wajid Nasin. You have the floor.
Thank you very much, uh, respected uh, Freed and the co-chair, honorable co-chair uh, of GAKSA. It was an excellent session, uh, and uh, I am really honored to have uh, the uh, time for uh, speak something. Um, it was a discussion, no doubt, from yesterday as well as this session, morning session. It was an excellent discussion. I, I will just have... Uh, not question uh, any observation, just compliment that uh, as uh, most of the speakers are talking about the capacity building. So I will I will just request uh, the honorable chair and the uh, higher management of GAGSA to ensure it uh, to be implemented in a practical way. So, so that uh, all the members, uh, we are members of GAGSA, honestly speaking, the Islamic University of Baha uh, is also the member of GAGSA from uh, Pakistan. So um, I, I will just request that uh, in all the members of GAGSA should ensure the implementation in the form of joint ventures, in the form of uh, capacity building workshops, in the form of joint ventures, uh, and also get together uh, to keep uh, all the least developed areas, uh, I mean, uh, to keep and group together to in collaboration so that all the members should also have the opportunities to share the ideas, to share um, they are not regarding climate smart agriculture. Thank you very much, respected chair. Thank you very much. I was just notified by Hans that we got a few more minutes he's given me. So uh, we got a few more comments here. Would you would you like the floor? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kaganga John from Uganda. And I work with, I'm a, a smallholder farm, but also I work with the uh, a local organization known as Chikando Environment Association. And I have been there for more than 30 years. And uh, I, I, form, uh, formally, before uh, Clement Smart Agriculture was introduced, uh, informally we were doing it. But when this uh, Clement Smart Agriculture was introduced. I discovered that we, are, we have been practicing it for quite a long time without knowing. And we have been also practicing agroecology. And now we are implementing a project known as Climate Smart Agro, Agro, Agroecological Innovative Project. And we usually promote uh, local innovations as well as uh, adding in scientific innovations. That's why uh, yesterday I was mentioning something to do with the, uh, promoting local innovations, especially with the farmers. Because with farmers, they are, there is a lot of knowledge there down there. But uh, what they need is to, uh, to, 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 to get people, the, the, scienti the, the, the scientists, to see how they can analyze it and then uh, disaggregate data and then document it and so forth. And they, they are working. And uh, what we do, we have been promoting local innovation so that we can improve the planet health, people's health and improving uh, people's livelihood. And we have also a motto that saying, which say that health uh, soil, uh, hell is, uh, I mean, hell is, hell is a soil, hell is a planet. And then we have discovered that uh, most of us are taking food, <coughs> which is, is not hell is, uh, but it, because we are, it is grown with, in the uh, unhealthy soil. Therefore, we are promoting also the health of the soil. And then apart from that, we are planting, we are concentrating on planting indigenous and, uh, uh, and the fruit trees. We don't promote these other, other trees and it, has, it is working because it had a lot of fertility in the, in, the, in, in the soil and also conserve the environment and not only conserving the environment, but also mitigate climate change. As I am concluding, uh, we have been so lucky that in our community, 
it was so dry. There was a, it was like a, there was no trees, but now we we even we, we named it a, a forest village because now when you you enter into the community, you will see you will not see the the building, you you will not see this land, but it is just covered with what trees and uh, it is like a, a, a agroforestry, and it it has made it has improved the people's livelihood. And it has made, it, and we know we are contributing a lot to the, the, the climate mitigation and adaptation. But maybe what we we, we are we are we are asking from this uh, forum that if we can get scientists to see how much we have contributed to to local, national, and the global world due to uh, I mean to uh, reducing. Reducing gas house emission. That's what we are asking now. Please, you we are requesting you to join us so that we can uh, do something and then also upscale. Because now even funding, okay, we got funding, but in getting funding, as my colleague said, with the smallholders, they have the, the, the knowledge, they have the, the, the idea and the forth. but putting the idea into the language the funders or the, the investors want is a problem. Also, I think we, there also we need a lot of assistance, not only for my organization or for my, my, my country, but I know most of the developing countries have such a, a problem. They come with, a, they have a very good ideas, but putting that idea down, become a problem and that's why we miss a lot of money from donor funding or from even government. That's, uh, thank you so for listening to me. Thank you very much. We had a whole list of, of questions that we were hoping to discuss, but we run out of time, unfortunately. But I would like to end with this one last question. The question was, how can GAXA support regional initiatives and networks that are working to remove climate smart ag uh, uh, practices? And I'll just answer what I would think. And I, I really think that we heard some, some comments yesterday. If GAXA could become the clearinghouse of information and if we could if we could meet on a regular basis, you know, maybe even quarterly or at least biannually, uh, and and learn what each other, what each region is doing, I think it's going to be tremendously helpful that uh, and some of these practices won't work everywhere, but some of the ideas can transition to another uh, region very easily. So it's really important that we all know what you all are doing and we can learn from each other. And farmers learn from farmers. So once we get the farmers convinced, the leading farmers, then, then others will follow. So anyway, thank you so much for all your comments. Uh, we hope to put a one pager together of all the recommendations that are the, the things that you all are doing and then we'll get, that, we'll get that out to you. But thanks for all your comments. Thank you. Back to you. Back to you. Thank you so much, Brad. <laughs> And I think that concludes the session and regional alliances, but it doesn't mean that it's going to end here. So we wanted to um, encourage everyone to continuously talk with one another, with the other regional alliances and whom you wanted to learn from. And I wanted, I have the pleasure to announce lunch uh, and hopefully see you back at 2.15 p.m. All right, see you then. Have a nice lunch. Good afternoon, dear friends. Hope you have had a good lunch and re-energize yourself. Great to, to see that we still have so many people in the room because as long as I remember Animal Fora of the Alliance, when the fun part starts of the meeting, especially looking to the internal things to be discussed, people have other business to do. So great to have you here. But before going to the uh, governance and something we, we really have to discuss, one positive remark or two positive remarks. First, a new regional alliance is to be born. Our friend from Armenia takes up the task to see whether or not he can start an alliance in his 
region is part of the region of which is very much needed so so that's a concrete outcome thank you so much and of course we fully support you and we we already spoke that will it will be a joint effort to establish that then i would like to give the floor to our friend from Newfield, because she would like to say something about what's happening in Europe or the European Union. Please, there is somewhere a seat, so please take the floor there or here. I'm, I'm not biting. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Hans. So this morning we heard a lot of inspire, inspirational stories about all the different areas in the world. And um, I would like to share something with you. Um, maybe you remember, but my name is Judith DeVore and I'm a farmer from the Netherlands. And uh, in the European Union, there is an organization, it's called Copa Cogeca, and they represent farmers organization and farmer cooperatives from the European Union. And they work together on a lot of different kind of topics. And one of them is actually climate smart agriculture and the environment. And um, this is something I really like to share with you because I heard a lot of people here present saying we need to listen to farmers, talk to farmers, understand farmers, but like I said yesterday, farmers have a lot of knowledge. So we can also learn from the best practices from the farmers organizations present at Copa Cogeca. So if you want to learn more about the actual um, um, uh, products they're doing when it comes to innovation, research, development, best practices from farmers, you can have a look uh, there as well because I strongly believe that farmers are a big solution for all the problems we see when it comes to climate change. And we should definitely listen to what farmers have to say. So thank you, Hans. Thank you very much, Judith. And of course, we hope to involve you and your region as much as possible, also your organization. Uh, global farmer network because i think that should be in the heart of it is in the heart of our work thank you so much thank you. dear friends we go now to the governance part um and let's make it not there are some serious issues but also perspectives to be created and i always like challenges and perspectives first of course you have seen we have had the strategic meeting meeting of the meeting of the strategic committee on the first of february preparing this annual forum and if you went through the notes, I think many of the things which were mentioned there are in the stage of implementation. Of course, advised about the setup of the annual forum, which we are now about the programs and projects. But one thing is still uh, bothering us is the implementation of the decision of the four last annual forum. And it's about the composition of the strategic committee. I think three years ago, two or three years ago, the annual forum decided that we should have a, a strategic committee. We have now around 50 members of the strategic committee to see whether or not we can come to a strategic committee where we have the action group leaders, the uh, co-chairs, of course the host, but especially also representatives of the constituencies. So the annual forum then decided let's have the constituencies nominate or not nominate but choose two or three persons for each of the constituencies and then of course everybody went away and it was hopeful and cheerful that those constituencies would nominate two or three representatives but uh, although the presentation unit secretariat said many replies called etc I think it's only one or two constituencies of, out of the six or seven we have, which could arrive at two or three representatives, whether it would be rotation scheme, et cetera. And of course it is difficult because what I saw also from the email exchange is that many constituencies had difficulty 
that there perhaps have seven nominees and had to choose them two or three. So the question arises because we could not implement it, whether or not we should stick to that decision or should take the decision that we maintain the, more, the broader strategic committee uh, as it was before we took the decision of a smaller strategic committee, because we can go another year, but I don't see it happening that we now, although there are, I believe in miracles in Rome, and sometimes they happen in Rome, miracles, but I don't see them happening in this case. <laughs> and of course you cannot ask the facilitation unit or the coaches, whoever, to decide who should represent who. And still, I think it's important that we, if we prepare, for example, for the annual forum, and there was a clear request also to have more frequently exchanged with the broader, the broader community of GAXA, that we maintain some kind of strategic committee. So we, I would like to listen to your, your input, but otherwise, my idea would be go for the second best option, maintain the city committee as it was last time, because last time we invited all members of the city committee and anyhow it was about 30, 35 people who showed up. So that's a reason, reasonable size. But I think perhaps that would be the best way forward, but we are, of course, we stand ready that uh, the team and I ready to your suggestion ideas, but I think that would, for me, be the most simple solution. Who? Marcel and Rosa. So Marcel, Marcel and Rosa. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, I think that that proposal that you just made makes uh, good sense uh, in terms of. Uh, bless you. <laughs> In terms of representation, because it's difficult for people to nominate, and also uh, in the smaller, uh, in the proposal for the smaller uh, strategic committee, there was always the option to uh, participate as an observer. So you would have the full uh, uh, participation anyway. So I think the proposal you just made, stick with the old strategic committee, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like that very much, but because I live by two or three rules besides integrity. It's a rule of inclusiveness and transparency. And I think as what was said also yes and, and today, it's so important that we work inclusively with all the members of uh, GAX and those who want to participate should have the possibility to participate. So thank you, Marcel Rosa. Sorry that I fully agree with this with the proposal you made. Thank you. Can I, who is somebody? Domenico. Domenico. So if I can share a point of view, uh, I think that the, the most inclusive solution can be uh, the best, even though maybe it requires uh, more members and so on. Uh, because um, one, at least from my experience with GAXA, what I really appreciate is properly the inclusiveness and also the broader uh, possibility to have a discussion with different stakeholders all together in the same room, all together in the same place. Uh, so uh, if uh, I can give my opinion, I will stay on a broader like uh, uh, representation, so at least as it is. Thank you very much. Domenico, for your support, I give the floor to Vayit online. Uh, thank you very much, uh, respected chair, for giving me the opportunity to have the the uh, talk and give the my opinion. So, in my opinion, uh, just I will suggest uh, this is Dr. Wajid from uh, the Islam University of Bahawalpur, Pakistan. So I am uh, also the member uh, of GAXA uh, last year, from last year. So this is my humble request to the respected chair. If uh, uh, they have to include some uh, least developed countries and the members from least developed countries. 
so that uh, the developed one ha might have to share the exchange of uh, the weakness or you can say to build up some collaborative uh, initiatives and to discuss and the opportunities to, or you can say such type of things so it is it will be very nice uh, and appreciative if you can choose uh, or select some people from uh, least developed members countries thank you thank you very much i think with the option now i think everybody is certainly also uh, representatives of least developed countries organizations within least developed countries are able to participate and certainly we will promote and stimulate that. Any other requests for the floor? Are you finished or? <laughs> um, so can I take that we maintain the strategic committee as it was or and then now is? I see nodding, thank you so much. Then we go to really serious business. At least we show you the uh, when it comes to financial and the financing of CACSA, we show you the financial report of 2022. Of course, 2023 is still underway, but we have the facts and figures of 2022, which was also shown in the uh, CACSA annual report. And I give Frederica the floor to present that slide. Thank you very much, Hans. Very briefly, uh, the annual for the um, budget for GAXA, we had um, in uh, the expenditures in 2022 uh, was 274,348. Uh, we have a general staff, uh, consultants, uh, technical support services. The major uh, expenses uh, uh, was on consultants and uh, uh, general staff, but uh, also technical support services. Uh, we remain for available budget for 2023 is 243,150 that we, uh, we agreed to uh, use for consultants, technical support services, uh, and general operative services. Thank you very much, Frederica. I always like simple and uh, uh, concrete. Keep the slide on. Uh, reports, especially when it comes to financing. It's clear that we are um, secured for this year, the whole year, with funding. But what we have seen, of course, over the last two, three years is we had, and that's also later on leading in another proposal, is that we were com completely depending on public funding. Uh, and we had the last nine years, we had donors from US, Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, uh certainly also ireland and perhaps one or two other countries but we are running out of donations or funding because for 2022 we have till now only and also 2023 only one donor left and that's ireland and ireland is a very strong uh donor and also confirmed supporting uh also the next couple of years but as you see, for this year we are secured, but we need to look for more funders. Uh, and I would say it doesn't have to be, and that's why I'm coming, but let's first see if, if, if there are any questions about this uh, oversight of the financing. I see no questions. Online, it's justice. justice. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. With the look of things um, on the budget report, we are just showed the expenditures, what the revenue, because we are supposed to have a presentation on the income to say this is what we received.
for the for the, 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 the period that we're talking about, and then versus the expenditures, because we cannot have a situation whereby we only have expenditures without having the revenues. What were the revenue like? The sources of those revenues, right? I think it's supposed to, I mean, to be reflected in our um, financial report to say who contributed what, right? Versus what we have expended. We have shown you on the table what the expenditures were in 2022. Two. <clears throat> and yes, but. But my question is more to do with what was, I mean, in terms of revenues, right? The source of revenues, I think they should be reflected also. When our, was, um, the source of revenue was one donor, and the donor was Ireland. And how much was that? Because that's income versus expenditure. Because we cannot just expend what we don't have. That's my understanding of financial I mean, um, reporting. Ireland funded around 70,000 euros in 2022. And of course, we had some remaining funds from previous year, but in 2022, we received 70,000 euros from Ireland. That's why it's so important that we look to broadening our funding base for our alliance. And of course, you can be assured that we will write as co-chairs letters to previous and current donors for funding. But it comes to the broader basis of uh, GAXA because <clears throat> we are hosted by or housed by and hosted by FEO. And the hosting arrangement means that FEO is, uh, uh, has a trust fund for GAXA and we follow the staff rules of FEO. But one of the problems with the hosting arrangement is, is that we are not allowed to uh, receive any funding from uh, the private sector or philanthropic organizations. And of course, that meant already that we missed, and I did my, we did our utmost, but we could not bend the rules. We missed already $1 million in 2022 of funding. And of course, FEO is a UN organization, and you know how the UN is working it's impossible to change a bureaucratic organization. Unless they are sell themselves are problems if, in the financial issues. But that's why also for a funding reason, but also what you have seen, I think the last one and a half day, how crucial inclusiveness is. And inclusive means all partners. And I think as we are sitting here, I call upon you, please help us to find more donors. But also I think we should, and that's a proposal which we also discuss in the city the committee to look for a co-hosting arrangement so that we can broaden our network because it's important that we still have the hosting arrangements with feo because of all the expertise which is in the building which we can make use of but at the same time i think there are networks out there which can strengthen our basis in our communities which have their own networks. And of course, we are not looking for six or seven co-hosts, but for example, it's a very strong network, which is very supportive and several members of that network are participating these two days here uh, in, uh, in, in Rome. And that's the International Agri-Food Network, which is have a broad network within farmers, within businesses, within agribusinesses, which could help us broaden, certainly when we go to the next phase of our work, try to support implementation of agriculture, sustainable agriculture is dealing with one of the biggest threats, which is climate, to support action on the ground, where, for example, some of the speakers are also member of, which are willing to help us to implement some of the Project and programs we have. So, based on the discussion in the um, Sentito Committee, the idea would be that we look to for a co-hosting organization, 
which broaden our strongholds in our communities with a lot of expertise. And of course, the first discussions has been started with the International Agri Food Network, but they have their own discussions. But it gives us, brings us in a direction probably where we, we need to go. Nothing is decided yet because it takes two to tango, but it helps us, helps us when it comes to inclusiveness, it helps us when it comes to technology, it helps us in capacity, and certainly it would also help us to get broader funding. And it's not that we raise our hand, please give us some money, but it helps us to reach out to much more entities to support the work we are doing as a GAX hub, because we need support. Ernie. Uh, thank you, Hans. I wanted to um, rise and speak in support of the proposal to establish a different governance model for uh, GAXA. I personally have been involved with GAXA since before GAXA was GAXA, when we had a whole series of meetings talking about the need for a different type of platform where government, academia, farmer organizations, private sector, civil society could convene around a table and collaborate and co-create. And that was a much different model than existed within the UN system at the time. There was strong recognition that the 21st century challenges that we're facing require a 21st century platform. And there was strong support to create what became GAXA. So we came together and we recognized quickly that we needed a home, we needed a banker, we needed a fiduciary agent to hold and manage funds. And the logical one was FAO because FAO helped give birth to GAXA. We then went through a period of years where we grew and evolved and we started to perform and we got a bigger appetite and we saw the need for more money. And we started to reach out and try to attract donors. And what we found was there was interest from the donors, but there was embedded customs, practices, bureaucratic norms within FAO that prohibited those dollars from coming in and being used to support the platform. And we tried hard. We put a task force together that met with FAO officials and tried to find a way to negotiate a, a, a relationship where we both had confidence we could bring money in. And a couple of you around the table were part of that process. Marcel, to my right, I'm pretty sure you were one of them. Uh, Federico, you helped us from a staffing standpoint. And I remember we had long hours uh, with the FAO gatekeepers, for lack of a better word, because that was their job. And we couldn't break through. There, there was no flexibility to allow for what we were looking for. So we went then back, and I don't remember my years. I'm thinking this is 2017 or 18. It was pre-COVID. And we said, well, what do we do now? Do we stay in the FAO house and just operate off of government money? Do we leave FAO and strike out on our own? And we looked at different options. And one of the options that we came up with was the concept of co-hosting, where we would stay hooked to FAO to benefit from all of the assets that comes with FAO, but we would also now have a modification of our governance system where we would have a not-for-profit co-host that could serve as the fiduciary agent and receive and manage funds that the UN system was not prepared or capable of, of managing. So this concept, Hans, is not new. Uh, we, 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 we thought about it long and hard. COVID hit. It kind of got pushed to the back burner, but now that we're coming back to life again, this feels to me to be essential for us to operate with great flexibility. So I would just say, Hans, we've a number of us have been thinking about this for a long time, 
and have high confidence that migrating to a co-host model preserves all the good we have with FAO and opens much greater flexibility to bring in the other partners that can also help resource what we do. So I speak in support. Thank you very much. Domenico. Thank you, Chair. So uh, I was just uh, recalling the proposal of the colleague uh, Roberta Ianna uh, today about joining the PCB, trying to amplify the toes. Uh, I was thinking maybe in, uh, in the situation that you describe, a more like uh, we can say relevant presence into, into the climate negotiation to the COP can really help, especially because now for agriculture into the uh, uh, climate negotiation is a particular fruitful moment, we can say. With the Coronivia and now with the Shamar Sheikh work program, agriculture has been uh, streamed into the discussion uh, into uh, climate change negotiation and countries are also finding ways uh, to implement NDCs. And uh, in that venues also there is the possibility to talk directly with delegates from countries, convince them on, on the possibility eventually to do donate and also to contribute uh, in terms of uh, like applying and uh, fulfill the NDCs. And I don't know, maybe uh, a presence there, like a more structured presence there can help also to find the donor uh, in terms of states and so on. I don't know, is a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Domenico, and I think it's a very excellent suggestion because I think we need to be there where we uh, need to be there also explaining the strength and insp inspirational activities which we are now going to develop with donors or with countries, governments, but also the whole community which is always there at the COP. Uh, so I think it's a very good suggestion. I give the floor to Justice and then to Alison. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair. I remember World 20, uh, the annual forum uh, that was held in 2016 and 2017. The issue of co-hosting, I think it was uh, emphasized a lot, uh, but I don't know what really uh, went wrong along the, li uh, the lines. But it's something that is, you know, I totally support to say, let's have that idea of co-hosting and co-creation. And then the other thing that also came out of that um, that meeting, the annual forum, was uh, I mean the the formation of a task force. I think it has been raised by the other speaker. And then that task force was tasked in, in terms of mobilization of resources for for GACs. But I don't know what happened to also to that committee. I think there is room for us now. We can let's say revive that committee and ensure that that committee mobilizes more resources for 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 for, for, for Kaksa, so that we can be in a position to strengthen the regional alliances i think we lost now connection but i know that ernie was part i think that was the increase of the working groups because uh, there was uh, a proposal to have a women with group and uh, then youth led group. so i don't know how what really happened um you know, from, uh, I mean, after the, the meeting that we had in, in Rome. And then the other issue that was also raised was to say, instead of actually having these IMO forums uh, in, in Rome alone, uh, I think say we were supposed to have it in Canada. So I don't know, <laughs> maybe it was because of COVID we could do that. But since uh, the formation of Canada, I mean, the GAXA in 2014, then 2015, we had the meeting and then, all these ideas that we're actually talking about, they were raised in that particular meeting. And I think what we then need to do is to add, let's reflect way back in 2016, 2017, what was discussed. We consolidated it, and then we, we act upon those uh, decisions or the outcomes of those, uh, those particular annual forums. Was they were very critical. Thank you. I think we have lost connection, but. Yeah, you no, know, I know I've heard what, uh, but I think Ernie was part of that working group. I think perhaps Marcel was also part of that working group that came together, did work. But I was not part of the group. But I, either I give uh, Ernie or Marcel the floor because they did their work. They came forth with some suggestions. Uh, 
I give them both to Kobe because that's better. I know I have it in front of me, but I'm not going to read out what was yeah, done. Yeah, we 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 did a lot of due diligence. This wasn't something we had a copy over and came back and provided a report. We met over months and we filed a written report. Uh, and I've sent the written report uh, into the facilitation unit so that there's a there's a record of minutes. So th this is not some quickly thrown together process. We were very careful in thinking about options. And one of the options, frankly, was to leave FAO and go off and operate independently. And we even identified a couple of organizations that we don't need to name today that, that maybe we would go be attached to. And we went through a pros and con exercise of what's the upside, what's the downside. And that didn't feel right. So we we rejected the options that we felt were not in the best interest of GAXA and landed on the co-host model. So, and Marcel, maybe you could help amplify or if. Marcel. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, I can only uh, support what, uh, what Ernie just said. Um, we found out that it's indeed, as you pointed out, Chair, uh, virtually impossible to access uh, private funds while being singly hosted by a UN agency, and a UN agency for that matter. Um, so I can understand uh, indeed uh, why you would go for a co-hosting agreement. I can support that in view of the, the needs of CAXA. Uh, we as the Netherlands have been one of the main donors uh, over the past uh, couple of years, number of years. Indeed, most of the funds, as you hinted at, uh, uh, available for this year is a no-cost extension of the funds that we donated to GAXA. We would very much suppose of, uh, um, support a broader donor base, and in that light, we can uh, support your suggestion to uh, look for a co-host. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it answers three questions already, I think, which is very good. Because... Uh, and we'll make sure that on our website that report is available again to all members what that committee did. And it came forward with a clear idea of co-hosting uh, because they went through the pros and cons of each of the several options, as Ernie said, going outside of FEO, uh, staying only in FEO with the handicap we have now or go to a co-hosting uh, arrangement. And at that moment, I think there was a clear preference for co-hosting, but of course, at that moment, there were several feasibilities or impossibilities for coasting, which have now been arising uh, as, a, as one of the possibilities. So the idea would be to go along that line. We are not deciding anything yet because, as I said, it has to be two to tango. And we clearly have to uh, write down all the elements of, of an arrangement. I think what I see is that there's a clear wish to st stay in FEO for the expertise which this organization is offering and also within the UN, but also to see with the co-host how we can broaden several basis for our work, certainly with the inspiring uh, two days we have had here. So uh, my proposal to Tara. Um, just uh, just um, to register the online support for the co-host ah. and uh, some of the participants. But I also wanted to ask if there is a possibility to have a short list of possible co-hosts. No. <laughs> yeah, of course I can. Short list of no, candidates. Of course, the yeah. question is, of course, do we wish to? Because I can mention five organizations or 10 organizations uh, which could be feasible. I didn't approach them, but I think it's important that we start working with one or two. Yeah. Uh, and what we are perhaps missing what's out there, and it has to be a strong network because we can go to a smaller organization. But one of the things which came out of that group, it has to be an added value besides the co-hosting with it, added value to the organization. At uh, organization, I mean Gaksha. I give Martin the floor. Thanks, um, and, and a really useful conversation. I mean, it seems overall, given that this is a multi-stakeholder platform, to have a multi-stakeholder hosting is also a helpful idea. I think one of the questions would be is how does that hosting arrangement get selected? Who gets selected and by what means? Obviously, writing down what that consists of, to some extent, a terms of reference for what hosting looks like, 
drawing from the experience of being hosted in, in FAO, which I think has informed a lot of, of the experience over the last few years, would certainly be be helpful. And then understanding what the path would be to select a co-host and on what basis. I think one of the questions would be is, is what's the funding arrangement for that? If, if that's a pro bono contribution of the host to, to GAXA, um, because I think that that funding question comes back. It's sort of circ it's a bit of a circular process. Um, but as on a conceptual level, co-hosting seems like it it can only bring value as long as the coordination between the two parts can be clear and clean. Because I think we need what's hosted in FAO to communicate well with what's hosted outside of FAO. Um, and so there's some ironing out to do. Um, but embarking on the process of starting ironing before we have the fabric maybe is, is worthwhile anyways. Thank you, Marcel. <clears throat> Thank you, having heard what's just been said, uh, can I come up with a proposal that we uh, as group endorse the co-chairs to uh, explore co-hosting, make a, a, a with uh, organizations as they see fit at this moment and make a proposal to the strategic committee and then we decide then. Excellent, and I, to me actually proposal, and I think it was, I think a good proposal to make a terms of reference, what do we seek in the co-hosting arrangement? So what does it mean? Also, how can it be materialized? Because it means also something for managing, uh, manage, managing, uh, coordinating. And then uh, of course it's up to the strategic committee and the annual forum then to, to, to finalize and to decide on it. And of course, in that process, we can identify because it doesn't say that we need only have one co-host. It could be perhaps two, depends how much they offer, I would say, how keen they are. But I think it's it's very important that it has the co-hosting is a stable network which which would have a, a, a marriage with uh, the host FEO for many years. Uh, and I think that's important. It has a strong basis in the work which the Alliance is doing has a strong relationship with the UN as well as with the uh, FEO. But let's work on, uh, Dada and I, together with the team, will work on the terms of reference as proposed by Marshall Work on the arrangements uh, which are feasible. What does it mean for the funding? What does it mean for the coordination? We bring back that to you, to the strategic committee for further discussion. And then, of course, based on that, we take uh, in an annual forum next year a final decision. Would that be the way forward? Edison. Yes, Hans, I, I agree. That's a good way forward. I would just like to add on, I think the terms of reference is really important. I think a timeline, though, is critically important because, as Ernie said, we have had, we've been working on this for a long time, then COVID hit. But I mean, if we don't get a decision on the co-host by the end of the year and we have to keep going on like this, it's not going to be helpful. So I think we need to say by the end of the year, we need some decision from some organization. If they can't co-host us, we need to find another option. Um, and then I, I think I also really want to make the point that we should be at the COP and the SB meetings as GAXA. We can apply for status as an NGO, I think, or work with our organizations to do that. We should be having an exhibit there at every meeting. We should be networking because we need to be meeting with countries and NGOs and we need to be visible. So I will be at the SB meeting. I know many people will be. I, this June, I think GAXA should be there and should be at the COP. And I guess the final thing I wanted to say is I I don't understand why FAO cannot accept outside funding because I'm working with UNFCCC, it's another UN agency, and they are able to take outside funding. They're getting funding from uh, a big foundation. So Maybe we go back one more time and ask and say that's an example. And the last thing is, can we, could we write a statement from this strategic committee meeting saying we really request the strong support of FAO and we need the strong support? 
Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. First, you can be assured that we will be at the COP, as Kaksa. Well, I come to you, sir. Secondly, I know other organizations, even within Rome, like the World Food Program, which is has a different position when it comes to funding from the private sector. And over the last seven years, when I've been working with FEO in different jobs, I tried with others to get things done in this direction. But the answer is in black and bold, no. We are now working on an, uh, I would say, uh, private or, uh, guidelines around uh, private sector engagement in governing body meetings. As a first step, I would say modernizing the relationship between FEO and other entities, because it's not only the private sector, it's also philanthropic institutions, et cetera. And of course, we have used all the examples uh, in Rome, in Geneva, even in New York, even in Nairobi. But at the end, it is the membership of this organization who decides, not only the management. I know for sure, perhaps in 10 years time, that we are modernized, but let's not wait for that. Because if it goes good, then we still can benefit from it, but let's not bet on one horse. Uh, I give the floor. Thank you very much. Um, my own issue, which I suppose to make mention of the, although you already said that we acknowledge FU that we doing a great work supporting. The other issue is that we need to do a neat assessment whereby we do a scorecard of which country has the enable environment for the resources to be given. Just like somebody have said that a working group of that should continue on that on the identification of countries that is willing to support the activities we are doing. That's first one, that needs an assessment. The second one, just like you mentioned, which you may not really support is the private sector initiatives. There are some private sectors that are doing well, industries that are doing well. It also buzzes to the philanthropists, uh, individuals that give to organization. Uh, that's my own uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, and I think it's a good suggestion because, but I think there we can cooperate. We will, we are building a new, uh, more interactive uh, website uh, where we can involve you also in having ideas about which countries to in the short term to to approach for further further uh, funding of activities of FEO. And I think with the annual forum, which we are now going to implement the three such I would say aspirational uh, activities which we are going to do further develop, uh, I think will certainly show to governance and others that Gax has life and kicking and very much needed to be uh, supported on the ground. Ernie. Yeah, just a point of clarification and caution uh, regarding Allison's suggestion of us participating in the COP and, that COP. and I'm not sure I know exactly what that means, but for those that aren't familiar with the Climate Convention, it is a separate UN body where member states, as well as observer organizations, accredited observer organizations are invited to participate and join. A number of us are accredited observer organizations have standing in the COP. So we as a member, Solutions from the Land, would not wanna abdicate our position as a member of the climate convention, if we were advocating in one way that might be not in alignment with another partner's way, we could find ourselves in a in a complicated situation. So I think GACSA participating in the COP as it re relates to knowledge sharing, demonstrating the importance of climate smart um, commitments and participation is perfectly logical. But when you cross into 
GAXA as a accredited entity that would be submitting recommendations, and that's what you do in the COP. You submit, in response to invitations, formal intervention papers. That takes us to a place that we haven't been before, where we've been negotiating language and text and positions. So I think we just have to be careful when we say we're going to participate, that we know what that means. And for at least at this year, I'm not sure how GAXIT could participate other than through FAO, because you you have to have formal standing. I chose my words carefully. I said we will be present at the COP. There are enough negotiators. I would say there are too many negotiators already at the COP, because for many years they cannot find a solution yet. But presence means that we can influence, that we can have a side event as GAXA, highlighting the need, what needs to be done on the ground, not being another negotiator. Uh, I would say if we can reduce the negotiators by half, we would have already had an agricultural agreement. So don't see us as negotiators, but being there with one or two or three side events, influencing the work to be done and showing what can be done on the ground, not only what is in words, in text, but on the ground. I think that would be, I think, an, an advocacy role which fits to GAXA without becoming part of the, I would say, the, the mafia. Well, thank, you, you thank, you for that clear, <laughs> thank you for that clarification. And with that, I support the move for GAXA to participate. Thank you so much. Any other remarks? So, so what we agreed is that we are going to work on the terms of reference, which we certainly draft will be circulated to all members. We're going to work on um, the conditions, the coordination, the funding, and how it will work, a, a timeline before the end of the year, and how it can work out in practice. That will come to you for further discussion in a strategic committee at the end of the year, and then we take, or there we take the next step, hopefully to, towards a co-hosting. And in the meantime, if everybody, can we agree to that? I see nodding. Martin. I could certainly agree to that. One thing maybe to, to add, um, because what we saw the resources of, available for this year, but not a projection of what the costs would be for this year. Um, and I think that might be helpful, particularly given the the ambitious pres presentations this morning that were, I think, really enriching on whether those are whether there's a costing included for that. If you if you want to deliver on those three important areas of Shark Tank and the the e learning, what what costs are associated with that? To have a sense of what 2023 could look like. Um, so so perhaps that that projection of of this year might be helpful as well for consideration. Yes, no, it's excellent. Um... As we say in, in here within the FEO house, those activities will be extra budgetary resourced. And it means, of course, that we already have funders in mind or already uh, discussing with funders of those three projects that can be funded out of the costs of the F facilitation unit. Because what you see is what we have. As I said, we can maintain our work with the facilitation use until the end of the year with some extra activities. But of course, we cannot fund the Shark Tank because that we need or e-learning. But that's why those presenters were sitting here because they will be part of the team, also the funding team. So with this, hello, hello, Justice. Yeah. yeah, I I wanted to add on from what Alice Asson had said. Um, what we need now is to register our presence mm -hmm. at national platforms and engage with our uh, national um, group negotiators at national level. And at regional level, we do the same. At uh, continent level, like say in Africa, we do the same. Because what we then need to do is to sell the idea. What we are proposing, we, are, we will be actually profiling policy solutions or alternatives. To say in terms of agriculture, this is what GAPTA is offering to you, right? So that could also help during negotiations. We have to start at national level with national alliances in Africa, where we are then saying, let's use those platforms 
to ensure that we cascade down the message to those um, maybe grassroots, um, I mean, the farmers, the negotiators, the government policymakers, you know, and so on. But what we then need to be, uh, what we then need to do is, as GAPSA, let's strengthen the national alliances, regional alliances. Their participation is very important. Some of these uh, policy formulations are platforms. Because if we don't platform, I mean, participate at that level, at regional level, even at regional level, you know, sometimes it makes life difficult even for us as um, leaders, of, I mean, within the regional alliances, you know, to really uh, make inroads. If we do not have the necessary support. So what is needed now is we speak with the same language. The art of this, I mean, annual forum, it has to really go down to say, this is what we agreed during um, the annual forum. This is what we are going to do. This is the way forward for, the, for GAXA and its members. And also the other thing that I wanted to find out is um, World Bank represented. Because I remember uh, World Bank used to participate during the annual forum. So I don't know whether they're also part of, they used to support um, the initiatives, I mean, for, for, for GAXA. I don't know how far, how far, I mean, where, I mean whether if they are present or they're not, and maybe if they're not, what actually went wrong with World Bank? Well, you also used to participate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think we clearly had a uh, way forward. Now we work on the, uh, the co hosting arrangement. I think we have a clear decision on how we would like to have a presence at the COP, but not being part of the negotiations. And of course, I leave it to every organization itself and every member to influence the negotiators, because I think that's the task of each of the organizations, how to influence which, uh, I would say, a negotiator. I think that's not the task or the idea behind GAXA, uh, but showing what we need to do in the framework of sustainable agriculture and climate change is important and what can be done on the ground. And that could enlighten negotiators to take the next step. But as I said, we clearly agree not to be part of the negotiation because that's for the negotiators. And I don't want to prolong this discussion because otherwise we distract from uh, and the program, but also from the work of GAXA. Alison. If it's I just have a really quick point. If if it would be feasible to get GAXA business cards that are nice looking and that each one of these people can have, and also a lapel pin for GAXA, because for when you're great, at the COP. But for me, it's great, but please provide also the funding. Uh, ah. Yeah, yeah. I really cannot make funny. false promises in that respect. We have at this moment. We have limited resources. The more funding you get, we can get. Those are cheap. Those, yeah. those are not expensive. No, but. Okay. Okay. Good. Great idea. We have written it down. The more new funders we find, the more we can work on that. With that, I would like, before closing the governance session, one thing is what we now and you have seen it already in the preparations and uh, these two days is that we work a little bit more with the team and sort of some kind of a management team of the three chairs and co-chairs of the action groups and the co-chairs to steer the work of the facilitation unit because there's so much to be done and it's way too much only for um, two simple persons like at least I speak for myself for an excellent person and simple person like Dada and me to do on our own so but that's why we formed some kind of a management team setting where we on a, a, a monthly basis sit together to steer the work of the facilitation unit think what needs to be done for you uh, via uh, gaxa with that i would like now to turn to the last part of our two days of the annual forum and it would be great if data takes it from there and that's of course that's the last part that's the closing session <laughs> okay well i wanted to start by honestly really appealing to your emotions and really letting you know that i'm very new to gaxa not very new somehow somewhere on the third or fourth year of gaxa 
the network that I helped develop in Southeast Asia was really featured as a model alliance and member of GAXA. And so in that sense, not new, but as co-chair, quite new. So I wanted to express my gratitude to all the dedicated old members who have somehow lent me uh, patience and a really warm welcome to this job. And especially, actually, to Hans for holding my hands. Mm -hmm. And I haven't, with COVID, with the long distance, with me being so far away from Rome, and me actually being super involved with so many activities regionally and globally, it has been quite hard for me to be with GAXA. But being here today has really encouraged me and inspired me to bring the same passion that I bring to the region towards GAXA. And my head is very much full of ideas of how we can move forward. And I wanted to give a bit of promise that I'll be more present and you can count on my passion that I think people like Marcel has, has seen in me in global processes, global climate policy processes. And so, yes, I also would like to share some views that I have formed in the last two days. You know, when we are now thinking of agriculture beyond production, but as part of the whole food system, because we say that food system is going to be the more sustainable approach when we look at sustainable production amidst climate challenges. We all see that the role of GAXA is to put all the pieces of the puzzles, to help put the pieces of the puzzles together. Because food system and climate smart agriculture are actually all puzzles, trying pieces of the puzzles, trying to be set together. And now IFAD yesterday highlighted one of the things that I have been advocating for in my work, in my variety of work as a policy advocate, as a climate finance expert, as a um, network builder. And this is that funding often overlooks, if I'd mentioned, funding often overlooks communication efforts or dissemination of information. I would like to add that funding also often overlooks the kind of task that GAXA is doing, and that is facilitation and coordination. It's not sexy enough for funders, right? And that's why networks like us have been struggling to get this sort of funding. Coordination and um, coordination and facilitation are often seen as a piggyback task that doesn't need sole focus funding. But actually, it is very, very essential, especially in these times when there are multiple actors, multiple interlinked um, factors that needed focus. And so weaving this thread together, which is where I see GAXA contributing, is, is often overlooked. But it is becoming more and more a full-time task. And so I think we need to highlight these things. Um, we need to highlight and we need to build that this is the value additionality of an alliance, a global alliance has, right? And this is what we need to sell to funders. So I wanted to get also the, val the value that was mentioned earlier. GAXA can bank on collaboration, on investment, and on nourishing. I saw this presentation earlier by one of our members, and I think that it is a good value to live by. And I really hope that GAXA members can really abide by this. We collaborate, we invest, not necessarily just finance, but also our brain power, our passion, our charisma, and we nourish our relationships. Lastly, I would like to urge, to urge the donors here. 
I see the presence of USAID here. Hello. <laughs> Oh. Presence of perhaps Canada. Um, you know, we, we we can't always say that FAO cannot accept money from a uh, private sector. And I'm very happy that we have found a way to solve that issue. But we're really urging the donors here now who are here. Isn't it very exciting to hear the previous presentations on the Shark Tank, on the Compass Fund, on, on capacity building initiatives. These are actually a, someone who really works on the ground with policymakers, with network establishments, with civil society organizations. These are the kind of tools that are needed by our farmers at the moment. And we hope, actually, I have this thinking that the remaining funds of GAXA, no matter how little, we hope that we can leverage it to attract other funders, to attract bigger funding. And so that is my call to the donors here in the room, to consider that there, there are these previews, the presentations earlier, and it came from the sense of urgency and relevance. They are really much needed, and GAXA is really hoping to facilitate that. And with your support, I'm sorry to be looking at the direction of USAID. <laughs> Marcel, I'm also looking at you. <laughs> Hello, Marcel. Um, really, let's put the past aside and really look towards what we have presented today. And it's really, as a glass half full person, it's really very positive and actually very exciting. We've got the presence of the youth. We've got women-backed businesses. There is a very unique alliance where some of the alliances that I work with are merely based on a research base or policymaker base, but there's nowhere like GAXA where the private sector really actively sits at the table together with policymakers and research organizations. So I think before Hans, turn off my microphone. <laughs> I would like to really thank everyone for coming and really please be patient with me, but you've seen the successes in the other region and I really hope to bring that to the table for that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we go to the real closing, uh, closing. yeah, we, yeah, but at least to sh shut down all the microphones. <laughs> Before I give the floor also to Frederica, is there anybody else who wants to reflect on these two days? It's not necessary, but you always have to do it. I see none, but I see happy faces, and that's already uh, very positive. Sorry, you have the floor, sir. Yeah, first of all, I'm so so happy on my behalf and uh, my, my 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 country and uh, Africa. We are so happy that. Uh, you have uh, the, the, the organizer have uh, thought so deeply to support us, some people, some of us, to participate in this very important meeting and also to meet different people of, of, of different calibers. Uh, secondly, uh, you have been told, I, I, I didn't want to con con contribute, but let me say, let me contribute on. Uh, participating in COP, because I have been participating in COP more than 10 times. But as you have said, it is very good to participate, especially in the side event. It doesn't, because even when you, you are not accredited or whatever, you can participate. Uh, secondly, last year, especially, yeah, last year, COP, COP, the COP of last year. Uh, 27. There was a lot of pressure and uh, so that uh, agriculture, generally agriculture, is recognized 
And uh, I can assure you that uh, the COP have started recognizing agriculture and putting agriculture on, on top of other, uh, other things. But it has been, uh, they have been talking about it as business as usual. But now if we also add pressure, you know, it is like adding pressure, not, not a real pressure, but it is also like adding pressure. Then last but not least, uh, I would request that uh, the work of uh, Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture to be, to be seen and be appreciated. We should try uh, uh, as much as possible to bring people to the grassroots on board. Because now even the funders, they are no longer funding uh, they, they are funding action. And uh, the funders are tired of <laughs> funding uh, words and so forth, but they want action. And the people who are doing most of the action are at the ground. Yes, I know everybody would ask what action, but uh, as we are talking about climate change, as we are talking about food insecurity and so many other things, if you don't act, the real action, whether the, the policies, the good, the good thing, the policies are there. We are just adding, or we are just trying to twist, like the way how now when we are, when we are, we are talking about sustainable, sustainable food system. And the system is there, but the way how we all of us talk about the, the agroecology, this is also something, uh, climate smart agriculture, intensification, and so forth, all of them are aiming at uh, the same goal. But now I'm just requesting that whoever goes, not only to, to the, 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 the Global Alliance, but even in, in, uh, at home, uh, from grassroots, national, and international level, then that is, uh, you have talked about uh, funding. I think it also it will help us also attract funding. And for us people at the grassroots, as I, I said, we have act actions or we have activities whereby if you capture them, you, some researchers, you are here and the, 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 the journalists, you can also put, uh, write about them. And then even the, it can attract the funders say, this is a very good action. That's what I wanted to comment on that. But uh, thank you so much for allowing us to also participate in this meeting on behalf of the smallholder farmers. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have to thank some people. First of all, but I'll come back to you later. We have to thank Frederica and Valentina, the new felicitation units, who pulled it off in a short term, but I always say never waste a good crisis. <laughs> they did marvelously with a smile, always on top of things. Thank you so, so much. And of course the team is sitting over there, but I would also like to thank the support team of the internet, the IFAN, the International Agri-Food Network, the support team also doing the social media, the support team making sure that we are not only here in the room, we are not in the virtual room, but we are all out of there. Universe. The universe. And I think it shows that a little bit of the cooperation has already started. Thank you so much, IFN. Then I have to thank you. Sorry, Marcel. And thanks to the translators. I was not there yet. Because I was going to thank at the end, but I'll do it now because the interpreters, the technicians, and certainly also the messenger for being with us these two days, because without them, we would not be sitting here because it would be dark. It would be too warm or too cold without those ladies. Thank you so much. But I would like to thank you all, both here 
in person as well virtually because you made this annual forum an inspirational forum we listened to each other and we have showed we are now nine years as gaxa nine years on the road and we have showed again that ex gaxa global alliance of climate smart eco agriculture is live and kicking more than ever and it's because of the members that's because of the multi-stakeholder approach that but it's because of you in person we're going to our 10th anniversary next year and of course we stand ready for offers of organizations or governments which would like to host the 10th anniversary of gaxa so send us your offers but before closing i promise frederica to give her the floor sorry just two minutes i would like to thank all the ladies who worked to help the realization of these two days please stand up i want to start with the administrative support uh, simona cafolla and uh, nelci brito moreno all the audiovisual messengers, badge, everything uh, we had because they work very hard. Let me thank also Gaia and Elena, the two new interns in the facilitation unit. And let me thank also Sierra and the grade because they was uh, the new, the intern of another colleague in FAO and they joined for uh, one week, two weeks, uh, the facilitation unit. And Phoebe from IFN for the social media. Maria Guardia was the graphic designer for all the cards in internet and social media. And, uh, and of course, last but not least, my uh, friend uh, Valentina Vitale for all uh, their support. I would like to thank all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. On behalf of Dana, every good thing comes unfortunately to an end. But we had an inspirational annual forum. We are strong here and we are strong out there. After more than nine years, the message is still clear. But let's remember the grasswood for those we have to do it, for those 860 million people who are living in hunger. Only if we deliver, we can change. And change can only be brought by people. You, we are the agents of change, the agents for climate smart agriculture, leaving nobody behind. Thank you so much. This annual forum is closed.